Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the, uh, well, Thursday, September 3rd, 2020, nine o'clock meeting of the regional Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, please call the roll. Okay. Commissioner Bertrand? Here. Commissioner Brown? Commissioner Johnson? Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? You have to unmute yourself. Here. Commissioner uh, Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commission Alternate Mulhern? He's here. He's here. Unmute yourself. Patrick, unmute yourself. Okay, there he, I, it looks like he's having issues there with his phone. Um, there you go. Commissioner yeah. Leopold? Here, without a camera, but here. I don't want to look at Brown? you, that's for sure. Okay. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Bator? Here. Commissioner Gonzalez? Here. Commissioner Watkins? Here. And I'm not sure if we have a, a representative from Caltrans. Did, did, you, uh, did yep. you call my name? Commissioner Caput? Here. This is Scott Eads with Caltrans. Great. Thank you. Hi, Scott. Welcome. Thank you. Here. That was uh, completed, Commissioner McPherson. Okay, very well. Okay, we will go on to item number two, uh, the oral communications. Uh, any member of the public uh, may voice their concerns on any item that is not already on the agenda. The, the commission will listen to it, but it cannot take action on items that are not on the agenda. Uh, please raise your hand uh, to address the commission. And, um, Raise your hand or dial nine, and once recognized, state your name clearly for the public. Um, and if you're having trouble, make sure you're using the latest version of Zoom. So is there anybody that would like to uh, present, make a presentation for, on oral communications? I have Brian Peoples. Okay. And then we'd like to limit the comments to three minutes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. My, thank you. This is Brian Peoples with uh, Trail Now. Uh, we are sharing our promotional ad we did almost a decade ago promoting the construction of the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail. We look at the history of our campaign to get the Coastal Trail built, and we see the key points are still stamped. They still stand after a decade. The branch line is costing Santa Cruz taxpayers millions of dollars to maintain and not helping transit now or anytime soon. The cost of building a trail adjacent to the tracks is not affordable. Segment 7A rail trail, already excessively expensive to standard rail trail construction processes, is expected to have another million dollar in change orders. Segment B is not even close to being affordable. Watsonville Trail is delayed now because of over cost overruns. The North Coast Rail Trail is delayed to 2025 because of cost overruns and project complexities. Delay will likely cost us the grant. We will likely lose the grant money from the federal government. Segment 7B shows us that destroying hundreds of heritage trees and building multi-story retaining walls is not socially or fiscally viable in Santa Cruz County. After a decade of claiming rail banking is not feasible, RTC staff has acknowledged that rail banking is both legal and financially feasible for the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail. It is not practical to believe that all the historic wood trestles would be or could be torn down and replaced with concrete bridges to accommodate high volume mass transit, fast moving trains. The corridor is 20 feet from the Pacific Ocean. Sea level rising mitigation plans will make a train financially and environmentally unfeasible. 
The smart train in Sonoma demonstrates how speedy trains through our neighborhoods will be a death watch. I can go on and on and on, but basically what we've been arguing for a decade now has now come true. But our community really needs a solution today for the coastal corridor and opening it up. We can't afford to keep the corridor closed. Again, taxpayers are paying for this transportation resource and it's not being used. We are asking you to find a solution today for active using that property for active transportation. No matter what the alternative analysis study shows, it will be decades away. Please look for an alternative today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Is there anyone else that would like to address us on oral communications? Sally Arnold. Ms. Arnold. Okay, I guess. Okay, um, how about Mr. Pico? Carrie Pico? I'm unmuted now. Oh, okay, Ms. Arnold. <laughs> Sorry, I was having technical difficulties. <laughs> um, well, I just want to say um, I'm Sally Arnold, uh, board chair, Friends of the Rail and Trail. <clears throat> and I really, um, I just want to say we're very excited to see all the progress being made on building the trail it is happening and we are getting a trail now and we are excited about that. And I wanted to say that in reviewing the agenda packet, um, we noticed that there were quite a few letters from across the county expressing support for passenger rail transit in the correspondence log. And when I counted them up, I, I saw 53 letters in favor of rail transit that had been submitted, which was 93% of all the comments on the topic. 93% of all the comments were in favor of rail. I just want to emphasize that. And I want to draw your attention to some uh, uh, particular comments that were made by some individuals that, um, that I thought were particularly pertinent. From Kathleen Crocetti, um, I support rail transit on the corridor. Rail transit is necessary for our county to continue to thrive. Both North and South County are dependent upon one another and the quality of life for those who must commute to work is greatly diminished by the amount of time we spend in our cars. Help us get out of our cars. From Susan O'Connor Fraser, rail transit on the corridor is a brilliant idea. Teens working at the boardwalk would have a safe and easy trip to work. Trains can easily support people on bikes and people who are disabled. From Val Cole, I'm excited about the future of commuter rail here in Santa Cruz County. It's green, affordable, predictable. Help South County workers, scales easily, will propagate last mile solutions and ties into the statewide rail program. From John Carruthers, I support rail transit for the corridor. Rail transit would let us continue construction of the coastal rail trail without delay. It's taken way too long already, let's get this done. From Kyle Rack, as an Aptos resident, I support the project to build commuter rail along the coastal corridor. It will make possible, this will make it possible for those who don't drive to have access to the neighboring towns that could cut down on vehicle traffic. I, I could go on, but just it's easy to see that the broad community has taken a keen interest in the TCAA, strongly favors implementing passenger rail on the corridor. I know you guys are getting closer to picking a locally preferred alternative, and I hope you'll see that um, there's just great community support for rail, and I hope, hope you will listen to the community's voice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pico, is that right? Is that next in line? Yes. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Yesenia has a presentation. What was that? Yesenia has my PowerPoint presentation. Oh, 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 oh okay. It's on. Okay. If you could share the screen. Give me one second here. I'm coming back to the issue that I raised uh, the last two meetings. So the last two meetings, I, I talked about the difficulties of building on a railroad easement. So I would like to revisit this and your legal counsel statement wrote, and this was in the agenda, there are three statements. Case law has held that a railroad easement cannot, can you go backwards, please? 
cannot, uh, cannot be used for a re recreational trail. That means if a railroad easement cannot be used as for a railroad trail, that, that's, we agree. Anyway, statement two, however, and this is the next part, the trail that the RTC has planned is developing a transportation facility involving active transportation uses. Focus on the active transportation uses, I'm coming back. And then statement three is, therefore the RTC may not need additional rights on most or any of the railroad easements. Next page. So th let's hit the first statement. Uh, it's settled law that a railroad easement cannot be used for a recreational trail. I just want, I'm just repeating the statement, statement two, next, next uh, slide. Um, statement two, however, the trail that the RTC has planned and is developing is a transportation facility involving active transportation uses. Now, I'm ref I want to refer to uh, a, a court case, uh, Taos versus United States. It happened in uh, Clovis, uh, Fresno County. And this is what they stated was their plan was phase one would permit use of corridor as a transit way for pedestrians, bicycles, and skaters. That's identical to the uh, trail. It would introduce equestrian and trolley buses. If you look at the picture above, this comes from the uh, MBSST, you have horses, you have bicycles, you have pedestrians. So it covers phase one and phase two, and phase three would bring light rail doesn't that sound identical to what we have going on in this county? Next page. So the ruling that the court gave is the current rail trail, I put the rail trail in there, the use of a, a linear park is in short, fundamentally different in kind than a railroad purpose, whether abandoned or not. However, the plaintiff's underlying fee interests are now burdened with a new easement. What that means is it doesn't matter if it's active transportation. It doesn't matter if, and, and then the last part, let's jump to the next one, that city planners hope one day to institute light rail service does not affect the result. So what they're saying is if you're going to build a trail, it cannot be on the railroad easement. Otherwise, you have to uh, pay for a new easement. Now, I've talked to people and they'll say, so what? This has more implications to just, than just saying, oh, we'll get eminent domain and we'll, we'll get the, the path. If you go through eminent domain, you'll have to show that it's environmentally advantageous to build a trail next to a rail. Uh, you'll have people arguing both directions. There's an added cost of, a, oh, uh, next page. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Next page. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Pico, your time um, is up. I'll just hit the next page and then people can peek at it. So it's about, it will cost about 50 to $100 million. The cost is skyrocketing out of control. Uh, if you jump down to 3A, it'll bring the cost up to about 430 to $480 million. Okay. So please take this seriously. Don't write it off that your legal team knows what they're doing. I, I'm not trying to be diminutive to them. It, it's, a, it's an issue that is, is uh, that you guys have wrong. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address this on, under oral communications? Mr. Keith Otto. Yeah, quick sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Great, thank you. Keith Otto, county resident. So I've been puzzled with a number of decisions and other happenings here at the RTC. It's been interesting to dig into some details a bit further and I'll say that findings have been eye-opening. Here's one example. A few meetings ago, a Santa Cruz County city shared with the RTC a resolution that their city council had passed advocating for passenger rail. And I'll add that this city has two city council members that are on the RTC. I thought the resolution was odd and in particular the timing as those same city council members, those same RTC commissioners would have voted at the RTC meeting just prior to continue with the $1 million transit corridor alternatives analysis study to determine if a bus or a train should be used for high capacity public transit in the rail corridor. 
So they're saying, go forward and continue to spend money on the TCAA study, but we've already made up our mind and we wanna train. All of this is pretty telling as to where we are heading. But the most shocking part is the dialogue that took place at that city council meeting leading up to the vote on the resolution. One of the city council members who was on the RTC told fellow council members and the public, funding for passenger rail comes from Measure D. It's money that's already being designated for that. It's not going to be more taxes. It's not gonna be more money. These statements are a fundamental disconnect from the facts. I can't say strongly enough that it's so disappointing to hear incorrect and false statements such as these. It's even more disappointing that they're being made by a member of the RTC. And it's further disappointing that another member of the RTC, another city council member was present, would have heard those comments and did not jump in to issue a correction. Wow. Just to be clear, the November 2016 County Measure D expenditure plan for the rail corridor states, the measure revenues do not include funding for any new train rail service. Bottom line, details matter, facts matter. If we don't pay attention to those, there's no way we're going to arrive at anything close to good decisions. You know, I've had a hard time understanding decisions made by the RTC. All of this has been illuminating, certainly a contributing factor into the decisions being made. A final note, I'll agree with one of the previous speakers who said, listen to the community. And I'll remind the commission that you have 10,000 signatures for a trail only solution. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening this morning. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to uh, address us on, under oral communications? Ben? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. My name is Ben Vernazza, and I've been a uh, resident of Santa Cruz County since 1967. I also served on the bicycle committee and was uh, going to as a representative to the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Trail Committee meetings. Ah, a sanctuary, a place of refuge and safety. I'm in favor of banking the rail and creating a sanctuary trail now. Here's some of the problems with rail. There will be no more easy financing, easy money for train fantasies like the LA to San Francisco train, the smart dumb Marin Sonoma train, the LA downtown train. Money's going to go now to pandemic needs and projects that increase per capita productivity because that's the answer for full employment and economic progress. So there's no more money for train fantasies. That's the way it's going to be. A terrible example is the one that I asked uh, to put up. It's actually uh, your segment 12 from the State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard. Uh, because the train's too heavy, quote unquote, uh, you say that it will cost a hundred million dollars to widen the road and to put two new bridges over the highway. Since that's probably low ball, that's the experience of estimates, maybe that's going to be 200 million, or maybe it's going to be a quarter of a billion dollars. Now, four or five years ago, the Caltrans came up with an estimate for a double decker for 25 million. Well, that maybe is 50 million now. And by the way, can you, can you imagine a train going through the village now? It's not even a village anymore. It has two stop lights and maybe some more. Now, lastly, one of the only industries in the United States that's running at above 100% manufacturing capacity are e-bikes, scooters, and such new vehicles that we've never seen before. And I see more bicycles in my bicycling, more than twice as many since last year because of this. Three people on my block just bought new e-bikes. E so 
I must say by ending, I do want to personally thank the, the Transportation Commission for what you did for me some 20 years ago. At that time, I had had two open heart surgeries. I was 40 pounds overweight. You provided a $300 credit to me for, to buy an e-bike, which I did. And along with physical therapy, it allowed me to, to lose 40 pounds and get back to 155 when I was in flight school in the 50s. And I'm still now flying at 86. So I'd probably not be here today without your incentive and would not be able to say to you, bank the rail, create a sanctuary trail, a place of refuge and safety. Do it now. I can't wait to be 100. Thank you. Hey, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, glad we could help. Uh, anybody else in oral communications? Donna Murphy. Ms. Murphy. Uh, you're on mute. Donna, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, she lowered her hand. Maybe she doesn't want to speak. Okay. All right. Is there anyone else that would like to address us on our, under oral communications? Uh, Michael Saint. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, Michael Saint here. I'm. I think I got the time wrong. I just showed up. So. Uh, <laughs> We're just in After time. for the last person, so this worked out okay, I guess. Um, pretty much been racking my brain a little bit this morning about uh, what to talk about to the commission. Um, it's quite apparent you guys are steadfast in your direction towards certain projects, but um, I think, you know, just to start out, I think 2020 has been a strange year for everybody. Uh, the pandemic, of course, has been horrific loss of lives, uh, economic disaster for a lot of our citizens, uh, as well as our entities around the county. But I think I came up with the question, is there anything we could do as a society or even as a commission get, getting down to the local level to find a silver lining in these times of upheaval? I think things are... Uh, up in the air and I always hear the comment by people that I can't wait till we get things back to normal and what is the definition of normal and I kind of look back and look at the uh, traffic we've experienced for many decades around here especially the last five years uh, look at people unsafe bicycle areas to drive and um, I think for those that have lost their lives and are feeling the impact of this, myself as well as all citizens, including yourselves on this commission, should maybe try to find a silver lining and do something to make life better, not necessarily go back to normal. And I think it's happening through the COVID as well as the wildfires. I'm not seeing the traffic on the highways often. And of course we know uh, people are out of work, which helps that issue, which is kind of sad. But um, the other things is that I think the staff should look at, as well as myself and the community, is telecommuting, I think, is causing part of this uh, relaxation and congestion. Uh, people not going to school, the kids not going to school, as well as the colleges. Um, and just in general, people not going anywhere. And I think we need to build on that uh, would be something we could do to maybe make the sacrifice of loss of life and people's hardships a little bit easier. Um, I'm not a proponent of going back to life as normal. I think I'm okay with some of these Zoom meetings. It doesn't have to be as crazy as it is now, but the idea, and what's funny is I came up and I was thinking, I, your slogan hey, came back to me. Are, am you, I almost you done? Come, complete your comments and after- Yeah, right basically. Yeah, basically, I, the, your slogan of let's get Santa Cruz moving again and Measure D came up, which is what we really need to do. So I think this commission needs to look at other programs besides widening highways and trains and things like this. The important part is getting vehicles off the road. And I think you should take some time and effort 
to do that. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address us on um, oral communications on transportation issues? Is that it? Hi, my name is Heidi Owens. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes we can. Hello, um, uh, I am running for town council in Los Gatos and I've heard from the residents here over and over um, frustrations about the beach traffic. So I'd like to encourage the commission to consider support for a formation of a joint powers authority between Santa Cruz County and Santa Clara County to study the Highway 17 corridor, um, looking at technological approaches to address safety as well as capacity. It hasn't been studied for 25 years. And um, that's my comment, so thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Barry Scott. Hello, this is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos and I'm calling just to make a, a general statement or two. Um, I wanna thank the RTC commissioners and staff for uh, the great deal of work that I'm seeing being done on streets, on the highway, the median, the rail corridor, repairs of the washout. Um, and I also wanna to speak to the, 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 the crisis that we're in with COVID and, and wildfires. Um, I encourage everyone to stay the course. And it, it's easy for, for people who are passionate about any outcome to use this pandemic as, a, as maybe an excuse to change directions. But I believe that the RTC is on the, is on the right path, is being deliberate deliberative and careful with studies. I look forward to the outcome of the transportation corridors alternatives analysis. And um, I don't think that at the other, at the other end of uh, COVID will ever be the same, but I don't think either that public transit is gonna become obsolete or unnecessary. Uh, for all the talk that I hear from my neighbors about e-bikes and electronic devices that might take over uh, They'll never replace public transit, which is a public good. It's a service. It's like parks and schools. You don't need to buy and insure your own public transit, which is, which is what a, an e-bike or an e-trike or any of these devices would do. So, you know, and the most exciting thing, we're building the trail. People forget this. We're building the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail. So for all the concern about the need for a Sanctuary Scenic Trail, well, we're doing it. You're doing it. Measure D is paying for it. And I'm just very excited to see the progress uh, uh, in Watsonville on the west side. And I think if we're all patient and we watch what happens, we're gonna see a, a fabulous trail. And hopefully we'll see some transit on that uh, rail corridor too. So thank you uh, for all you do. That's all. Thank you. Okay, is there any, anyone else that would like to um, make comments on our oral communications? I don't see any other hands up, Commissioner McPherson. Okay. All right, we will move to um, the next item, um, the consent agenda, items four through 18. Um, is there any comments, uh, anybody would like to pull an item on the consent agenda? Any commissioner? Uh, Chair McPherson, I'd like to um, um, announce some handouts and replacement pages first, if that's oh, okay. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Go ahead. So there are handouts for items 2, 20, and 22, and those are posted on our website. There's also um, a replacement page. Um, um, page 3 of our agenda is a replacement page um, that was posted last minute for item 9, which is on the consent calendar. Um, we incorrectly um, listed the dollar amount on the agenda as 60,000. It should be $44,425. And that was correct in the staff report and the resolution. There's also replacement pages for items 22 and 24. And that's all I have. Okay, very well, thank you. Um, is there anyone on the commission um, recognizing those um, Additions, uh, anybody would like to pull an item off of the consent agenda? Is there anyone from the public that would like to comment on an item on the agenda, consent agenda? I'll Seeing move the consent agenda. 
We do have a comment. Give me a minute here. Um, Sally Arnold. Thank you. Um, I just want to really quickly say that uh, from Friends of the Rail and Trail, we notice that uh, items eight, nine, and 10 are about making continued progress to maintain the right of way and the rail corridor. And we re really appreciate all the, the attention to detail that the staff is putting into making sure that these various contracts happen so that we can clean up that corridor and put it to work. And we just want to acknowledge the work there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Did you call me Brian Peoples? Yes. Oh, Brian. thank you. Um, is the item number nine um, one of the ones we would address on there? Yes. 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 Um, so I want to remind you that that North Coast Rail Trail has been delayed to 2025. Um, the federal grant in the project lead organization is not doing any work on it. And it's very likely you're actually gonna lose the grant money in my personal discussions with the federal administrative group. Um, I personally actually work for, um, for industry that deals with government contracts and the actual financial aspects of it. So it's very likely that money is gonna be lost the reason it's lost is because of the complexity of that project and, and the idea that you're trying to put the trail um, through the farmland, taking away farmland, and uh, rather than just pulling the tracks up. So um, I'm not sure why you're going to allocate money for continuing to do the North Coast Rail Trail. It adds no value. and um, your overall budget's going to get really hurt by the um, by the pandemic. So I'd question that. That's all. Thank you. Could I Thank ask? The, this is Andy. Could I ask the uh, executive director to respond to that comment, please? Um, there is no threat of us losing federal money at this time. The federal government um, pushed out the grant um, several years due to um, cost overruns on other projects, not our project. Um, we fully expect to be able to go to construction in a few years. And in fact, um, the federal uh, team is still working on the project. They were gonna be out here um, uh, this week um, to, to do a, a, a job tour of the location. And the only reason they didn't come was due to the fires. They're pressing forward with the project as quickly as possible. We are as well. And in fact, they're looking for opportunities to advance this project back to the original schedule, which would allow it to go to construction um, next year um, because some of the other agencies are dealing with um, strains on their budgets and may not be able to make their match, in which case our project would move to the, to the front of the list. Um, they're also looking at um, possibilities for stimulus funding for our project so it could be constructed next year as well. Thank you. Could I move the consent agenda? Yes. I would second. This is uh, Commissioner Leopold. And I just also like to add that uh, it, it seems more likely that Brian from Trail Never is just trying to find ways to actually not get the trail built instead of actually uh, working with us to actually get the trail built. He's, he's, he's uh, tried to organize farmers to sue us uh, now he's contacting funders to try to get us to drop grants. Um, we're, we're working to build the trail. Good to hear the update from the uh, executive director. Okay, we, we have a motion second to approve the consent agenda. I think we'd better call the roll. Uh, that's correct, Mr. Chairperson. Commissioner Bertrand? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Johnson? Who was that? We couldn't hear, I think. Who was? Before? Commissioner Johnson? Oh, aye. Sorry. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commission Alternate Mulhern? Aye. Commissioner Leopold? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Bator? Aye. Commissioner Gonzalez? Aye. Commissioner Rotkin. Aye. 
That was unanimous. All right, we'll move to item on the, we'll go to the regular agenda, move to item number 19, uh, commissioner reports. Are there any oral reports from commissioners? Seeing. Um, chair. Oh, yes, uh, Ms. Kaufman Gomez. Yes, thank you. Um, we had a conversation with Monterey County on Monday. Maybe Ginger can share just a little bit about that uh, with regards to the, the planning stages of their train and um, the connectivity of the South County of um, Santa Cruz. Would that be something that we can either, either report out at a different time or maybe Ginger Diker, who was in the conversation, can share a few words about that? Sure. Just, um, <laughs> Before you do that, Commissioner McPherson, just a quick reminder, we do have a 9.30 public hearing um, schedule. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Let's, um, let's go to the 9.30 public hearing uh, that time, having already arrived. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll go to item, uh, we'll come back to that for a brief comment. That's uh, a good idea. Uh, item number 22, uh, public hearing, Measure D, five-year program of projects for regional projects and community bridges, lift line. Uh, Rachel Marconi, uh, the Senior Transportation Transportation Planner, will be addressing us. Hi, Rachel. Good morning, commissioners and members of the public. Before you today is the five-year plans for Measure D. And I'm going to do a little uh, PowerPoint here, so I'm going to try to share my screen um, after Yesenia stops sharing hers. <laughs> Let's, um, let's do Ian, you'll have to allow Rachel to share. I, didn't I think it's going to go. Yeah, there we go. Um, oops, wrong one. <laughs> can Word. you guys see my screen? Or are you seeing a yes, we can measure D on it? Yes. Okay, perfect. Versus a tree in the background. Um, so before you today is the five-year plans for Measure D. We update these annually. They are um, required in the Measure D ordinance that was approved by voters back in 2016. Um, just as a quick refresher on Measure D, I think most folks know what this is, but for um, those who might be joining us for the first time at one of our board meetings, um, Measure D is a half cent sales tax that was approved by over two thirds of our voters back in 2016. The tax started to be collected in April of 2017 with first payments made from the state to the um, county and all of and the RTC distributed those funds to everyone starting in, I think it was August of 2017. It's a 30 year tax and it on average has been generating about $20 million a year. Of course, with the recent economic downturns, that amount has varied and, and we're not completely sure what the totals are gonna be over the next few years as we enter um, recovery from COVID uh, shelter in place um, ordinances but um, we're on average about $20 million a year. It funds a lot of local priorities and um, includes extensive taxpayer oversight, including a taxpayer oversight committee, um, the five-year plans, which go out to all of the recipient agencies and give the public an opportunity to provide input on specific uses of the funds, as well as um, independent audits and financial reports. So the expenditure plan that was approved by voters um, identified certain uh, categories of funds where the Measure D sales tax measures would, funds would be distributed. 30% of the funds are for neighborhood or local road projects. The majority of that funding is distributed by formula to our um, four cities and the County of Santa Cruz here. There's also 20% of the funds are for transit and paratransit for seniors and people with disabilities. 25% of measure funds are for highway corridor projects. 8% of the funds are for the rail corridor and 17% of the funds are designated for by the ordinance for active transportation, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network and Rail Trail. So the five-year program, well, the Measure D program covers 30 years and that expenditure plan gives us some basic guidance on how these funds can be spent. Um, we prepare these five-year plans to show what we're planning on using the funds for in the near term. So this year we are updating the plans to add fiscal year 
24, 25 to the five-year plans. And we've also updated um, how much money was actually spent in prior years. Um, some of that is based on preliminary um, unaudited numbers for fiscal year 1920. And then we've, um, and then the RTC is specifically required to adopt the five-year plans for the highway projects, the active transportation category, and the rail corridor. Also because Community Bridges Lift Line, which receives 4% of the total measure D funds, is not a public agency, the RTC serves the purpose of um, providing the public process for review of that plan. So the 2020 updates that we've made um, from what was approved by the commission previously have been um, modified to reflect lower revenue forecasts and economic uncertainties over the next few years. It's also respreading some of the funds based on updated project schedules. And when we really, we, because of the lower revenue forecast, we wanted to refine when we really think we're gonna need to make payments on some of these um, projects. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, we also added fiscal year 24-25 and um, focused just on some ongoing costs. We did not add any new projects for these five-year plans. Given the uncertainties right now, we want to maintain a large reserve on some of these programs or at least some cushion just to make sure that we can adjust as um, there might be changes in the economic situation and how much sales tax revenue is actually generated. Um, overall, we did make modifications on several of the programs, especially in the rail and highway categories um, to reduce some of the funding that was previously um, designated for projects because we want to maximize how much federal and state grants we might be able to secure for projects. So um, in some instances, we reduced the measure D commitment to those projects for now until we really refine what the grant requirements are. So if a grant's requiring a 10% match, we'll come back to the commission and say, hey, let's program 10% of the funds that would be needed to go after that grant. In some instances, a grant might require 50% match. And so then we'd come back to the commission also to say, we need to program some more money and, and make sure we can access those funds. So starting um, in a attachment one exhibit A of your packet is the five-year plan for the active transportation program. It's a spreadsheet. Um, and 17% of the funds, as I mentioned earlier, are for active transportation. And this is the 32-mile um, coastal rail trail and 50-plus mile Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail um, and project overall. It's based on the master plan that, for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail that was previously approved by the commission. And the goal is to increase options for biking and walking in our county. The five-year plan supports um, 18 miles of the trail. There's either funding to serve as grant matches, there's funding to um, do some preliminary environmental review and design and right away on some sections of the trail, and there are funds for ongoing maintenance of the corridor. So on this map here are the sections that include that are receiving some funding. Notably the section of trail between State Park Drive and Rio Del Mar is um, incorporated into the Highway 1 project in that same section and so some of the preliminary environmental review is happening um, through that uh, category instead. 25% of Measure D funds are designated for the Highway Corridors category, which is focused on projects along Highway 1, as well as congestion and safety projects and traveler assistance programs. So there are auxiliary lanes, bus on shoulders, bicycle and pedestrian crossings over Highway 1. There is the Freeway Service Patrol, which is the roving tow trucks along Highway 1 and Highway 17 and the Safe on 17 program, which last year the commission doubled the funds there that are going to the California Highway Patrol to increase patrols along Highway 17 with the goal of reducing collisions and speeding. Um, and then the program also includes funding for the Traveler Assistance tra Transportation Demand Management Program, the Cruise 511 program. And there is a bit of funding um, last year that the commission approved that is um, being provided to some of our partner agencies 
to assist us with outreach to um, employers and employees and commuters in our county to help them find alternatives, ways to get around and reduce congestion. So as I mentioned earlier, there's um, highway auxiliary lane and bus on shoulder and bicycle and pedestrian crossings. Um, right now we're wrapping up uh, work on the pre-construction phase of 41st Avenue to SoCal Drive auxiliary lanes, which um, will extend auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulder facilities all the way from Morrissey Boulevard to 41st Avenue. And that also includes the Chanticleer Avenue bicycle and pedestrian bridge connecting um, the ocean side and the hill side of Scanning Highway 1. The, we hope to be able to start construction on that project next year pending um, if we receive some grant funding from the state. Um, we also are working on, and the five-year plan includes funding for pre-construction phases of the state park um, to Park Bay Porter interchange, auxiliary lanes and bus on shoulders projects. And then we are just starting work um, earlier this year on the environmental review and preliminary engineering for the Freedom Boulevard to Rio Del Mar to State Park Drive interchange um, project, which also includes replacement of the two railroad bridges. Notably, the State Park Park to Bay Porter project also includes the Mar Vista bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing. And that was an action taken by our board earlier this year to combine it into that project in order to accelerate delivery of that project. So just, I have a few little maps just to zoom in on those areas. The stars are where the bicycle and pedestrian bridge is located at Chanticleer. Um, and we have the Freedom to State Park with the trail project in, integrated into it. So 8% of the Measure D funds are designated for the rail corridor. The majority of the five-year plan focuses on utilizing those funds to preserve the existing railroad infrastructure. So this is maintenance, storm damage repairs, um, bridge upgrades, and analysis. Um, we also have funding in the rail category to analyze transit options along the railway. This includes the um, transit corridor alternatives analysis that's currently wrapping up and is expected to be finished in early 2021. There's also um, Four million dollars that was previously designated for environmental review of rail transit options. As I mentioned earlier, we've decided to scale back how much money we're programming specifically for um, some projects right now because we want to maximize how much money we might be able to secure from other grant programs. Um, pending what comes out of the TCAA analysis, um, we will and cost estimates for environmental review and preliminary engineering, we would come back to the commission um, sometime next year with recommendations on specific amounts to program for environmental review of transit options, if that's the direction the commission is moving. Um, for the one of the neighborhood projects that is not, um, for some of the neighborhood project funding, by. $10 million of the total neighborhood project funds go for the San Lorenzo Valley Highway 9 corridor rather than going out to local jurisdictions. Um, the Highway 9 corridor plan we've made almost no changes to, just reducing um, some of the funding that was at, to reflect how much was actually spent on the corridor plan. But other than that, right now, we're just recommending holding most of those funds in reserve. Um, given the fires, especially, I think right now we're going to want to work closely with the county and Caltrans to determine what kind of recovery might be needed. And um, some of the priorities that were identified in the corridor plan might shift slightly. Um, now, there is still funding in there designated to serve as match to leverage um, some funds for access to schools in Felton. That was the highest priority project that was identified by the community. Fortunately, Caltrans has been able to expedite um, some of the work on that and secure some shop funds, which I'm sure uh, Scott Eads will report on in a, in a bit. But um, for right now, we're just really recommending holding steady on that and reevaluating what the needs are over the next few months. Finally, for the regional projects, there's the Highway 17 Wildlife 
corridor project, which um, in the Measure D ordinance designated $5 million over the 30 years to um, fund this project. Unfortunately, that means $166,000 a year, which would take 30 years to generate enough money to actually build the project. But fortunately, we do have some capacity within the cash flow um, model to facilitate a loan from the Highway 1 corridors um, bucket in order to pay for this project. And so the five-year plan for both the Highway and the Highway 17 corridor includes a loan um, of funds. It's about $3 million up front. Um, in order to expedite delivery of this project in 2021. And Caltrans is just now wrapping, wrapping up all the design work on that project and expects it to be ready to advertise um, in the spring. Project also includes a grant from the Land Trust, if I'm correct. It does. Right. The Land Trust of Santa Cruz County is providing $3 million of the funding for construction. That we shouldn't be able to note that generosity. Yeah. Absolutely. This project exists because of the hard work that the Land Trust has done. Um, the next category of projects is the 20% of total Measure D expenditure plan funds are designated for um, Santa Cruz Metro and Community Bridges Lift Line to provide transportation services for seniors and people with disabilities. And as I previously mentioned, the Commission um, oversees how the funds for Community Bridges Lift Line are um, spent. So their new five-year plan from Lift Line Community Bridges is to add an additional part-time driver to provide door-to-door -door services for people with um, disabilities that need paratransit service. It also includes funding for van driver training, a trainer and, um, and training and their outreach dispatch and scheduling um, operations that are required to be able to provide that additional service. They also have designated some of their funding to purchase replacement vehicles and they are actively and successfully using Measure D to leverage other grants. And then they've also purchased an operations facility down in Watsonville. And so they're using Measure D funds to pay for that facility. So today, the commission is asked to review the five-year um, proposed use of funds for the regional projects and lift line to have a public hearing to consider public input. There was just one written comment that we received that was distributed as a handout. Um, we did send notices about the public hearing to our mailing list of nearly 3,000 people who have asked for information on any of these categories of projects as well as general RTC info. It was advertised in the Sentinel and via our social media outlets. Our advisory committees, the Bicycle Interagency Technical and Elderly and Disabled Advisory Committees all reviewed the five-year plans at their August meetings. Um, the ITAC and ENDTAC recommend approval of the five-year plans as a as um, proposed and the bicycle committee specifically recommended all of the proposals for funds that um, will benefit bicyclists. And after that, we would ask that you approve the resolution approving a five-year program of projects and amend the fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, after the commission approves the five-year plans and on an ongoing basis, we work on project implementation and construction and using um, Measure D funds to go after grants and really maximize um, how far we can get our Measure D funds to go. Then we do the annual reports and audits at the end of each um, calendar year and take those to the Taxpayer Oversight Committee for review. And then we're also, you know, constantly looking at the 30-year strategic implementation plan and how to get all of the projects that we committed to voters to implement um, done as quickly as possible. And then we also have our Measure D website, which is regularly updated with the latest information and is available for the public. So next we'll do the public hearing instructions based on oral communications. It seems like pe people are pretty well versed in how to use Zoom and to raise their hand, but um, we'll have staff um, 
Yesenia will help facilitate calling on individuals. Um, so you, you can raise your hand. If you have a laptop, you might have to click that participants button that's at the bottom of center of your page when you kind of doggle your mouse there. And then um, it will give you the option to raise your hand. And then we ask that after you've um, spoken that you lower your hand. So with that, um, Commissioner McPherson, I'll hand it back to you and I'm happy to answer any questions that board members might have. I might, I just ask what the uh, projection for the income or revenue is 19 to $20 million a year from measure D. Uh, what's the projection? How much lower did you lower it by 10% or? <laughs> sure, yeah. The commission back at your June 29th meeting um, lowered the revenue forecast. Um, they were 20% lower for 2021 than in 1819. We are starting just actually yesterday to receive updates on what the actuals were for fiscal year 1920. And I'm happy to report that they are looking a a little bit rosier than what we had um, anticipated at the end of um, June. And so we will be uh, looking closer at those numbers and bringing possible modifications to the Measure D forecasts um, starting with the Budget and Administration Committee later this month. Um, so that will give us a little more cushion if we do need amendments over the next year to um, adjust the five-year plans. Good. Any questions from the commissioners? Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I was curious about the uh, transit analysis, given the fact that um, the more you read that there are going to be permanent changes uh, in, in terms of ridership and everything over the next five years, probably because of the, the, the behavior of people post COVID-19, whereas fewer people are going to be traveling on transit and so forth. So, I'm just curious as what, to whether or not that is being factored in, in, number one, into the analysis. Number two, with respect to the animal crossing on Highway 17, what is the, what is the total cost of, of that? I heard, you know, two years ago that it was going to be like three or four million dollars, and a lot of it was coming from the land trust. And now you're telling us that we're going to borrow from Highway 1 and Highway funds uh, for Highway 17 of the amount of $3 million, is that true? So the total cost for the Highway 17 wildlife crossing um, is dependent on what the final design and engineer's estimates are, but we've always known that that was gonna be somewhere in the eight to $12 million Range. I, don't th I don't think we've always known that. I, you know, I kept hearing $5 million or something like that. But a $12 million, a $12 million um, how extensive is it? I always I thought it, that it was essentially just, um, you know, a, a tunnel or something underneath Highway 17 on just one location, or is it, is it more? Sure. It's just one location. It's located a little bit north of the Laurel Curve. Um, Caltrans did make a presentation a couple years back on the wildlife crossing and we will be inviting them to come back in the next few months to provide an update on the project. Um, it is essentially though, and I hope I don't misstate this, but essentially what they're going to be doing is building a bridge. So Highway 17 will become a bridge and then the um, area underneath it is the wildlife crossing. So it does require rebuilding all of the deck along Highway 17 at that point. And the cost estimates have always been in this range. I think that um, the $5 million number that you're thinking about was because um, when we first developed Measure D back in, you know, when the folks were working on the Measure D expenditure plan back in 2015, 2016, um, we always knew the land trust was going to be raising between two and three million dollars for the project and that um, the measure D ordinance would need to provide five million dollars. So, forgive me, sure. but, I, Rachel, but I don't think that was clear to the voters. I don't think that was spelled out that we we're going to spend 12 million dollars on one, essentially one bridge. But uh, help me understand a little bit about the transit and uh, transit analysis that is happening. Sure. I'm going to actually defer to Ginger or Guy to discuss how the TCAA might be integrating information um, and 
current trends related to COVID. There's a lot of unknowns. Um, obviously, um, people are commuting less right now, um, but there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of what the long-term effects would be. This discussion is going on, not just at this commission, but um, at, at pretty much any transportation commission or authority. Um, um, generally, what we're hearing is uh, we expect that this, uh, this impact um, will be reversed at some point. Um, uh, long term, uh, we expect that uh, traffic will come back. Um, we are talking to our consultants to see if there's any adjustments and, and how, how things go. I mean, there's a lot of questions on, on what people are going to do. Um, are people buying less cars because they don't need to commute to work as much, or are they buying more, more cars because they want to be in their own car? If they don't have a car, would they be more reliant on transit afterwards or less reliant? We don't have the answers to all of those questions yet, um, but we are considering them moving forward. Do you happen to know what the ridership, how, how far it has gone down, Guy? Um, I don't know. To San Francisco and like no, I'm talking about I'm talking now. about Santa Cruz County. In Santa Cruz County, it, I've noticed that traffic has come back on Highway One between uh, Watsonville and Santa Cruz, but it hasn't come back on Highway 101 on the peninsula, which I found to be really interesting. Forgive me, I'm talking about transit ridership. Well, and, and I'm and some of us are uh, members of Metro. It's down over 80 percent, uh, but we're making some really uh, diligent efforts to. Uh, get these people back, but there are restrictions on how many people you can allow on the bus because of COVID and so forth. So there's a lot of variables that go into that reduction, but uh, we're just hoping to get them back as quickly as we can. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Rock, did, did you yes. have a question, Mike? I did. Um, I, I'm curious if uh, anyone on the staff um, guy or someone else can give us a just a large a big uh, high high level picture of how much has the COVID uh, loss in funds or projected loss of funds from COVID and perhaps impacts from uh, sales tax from the fire and so forth slowed down our projects. I've been asked this by a number of members of the public. In other words, we we were we if you go back to February, you know, we had, sort of had certain expectations of where we would be on various projects and how they're developing. Some of those depend on funding from the federal level and so forth, but across the whole country there's money down in all kinds of categories. So to what extent right now would we sort of I mean it has to be ballpark. Would, would are we slowed down by what's happened here in terms of our expectations of project delivery? So for last fiscal year, we were thinking we were going to see about a 14, 15% drop in revenue. Um, we only lost about 1.4%. So we're pretty flat. And then the first few uh, sets of receipts that we received this year were higher than projected. So we're a little bit baffled by the numbers right now. Um, we're not exactly sure if it's due to the Wayfair decision or how the tax authority is distributing funds to us. Um, um, as part of the self-help um, county coalition meeting yesterday, we're trying to get representatives from the tax authority to give us some idea as to why the numbers are jumping all over the place. So what we've done as an agency, RTC um, adjusted the budget in, uh, at the end of, of June to represent a 20% drop in expected revenue from 18, 19 numbers. And um, that was so that all of the local agencies could plan to receive less revenue. We are actually distributing revenue as it comes in based on actual receipts. So they haven't really seen that drop in revenue. As for the regional projects moving forward, we had enough funding even with the 20% drop to deliver our projects as scheduled because of the timing. We're early on in our measure. We're doing the pre-construction phases. When we submitted our grant applications, we adjusted our numbers to account for a potential 20% grant so we wouldn't overextend ourselves. So all of our projects are moving forward exactly per the schedule that we anticipated, and we really have not seen a hit. That's incredibly good news. Thank you very yeah. much. Very good. Uh, Mr. Mulhern. 
Uh, th thank you. Um, I just had a, a question about uh, on the staff report on page three uh, under the uh, discussion of the ACTA's transportation investments. It mentions adding funds for implementation of a remedial action agreement between the RTC and County Environmental Health. Could someone discuss what, what that is, the, the remedial ac action agreement, what that entails, what it's for? Luis, do you can I, I can the answer to just wanted to defer to Ginger if she wanted to answer, but I could also answer. Ginger, did you want to address that? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, the remedial action agreement is the agreement between our commission and um, Santa Cruz County Environmental Health Department in order to assure that any uh, contaminants that are found along the rail corridor are addressed to keep um, public safe from any uh, potential exposure. Um, okay, so so for for projects that, that the RTC is doing in the rail right of way that uh, will be responsible for uh, whatever um, environmental issues there are with our with our projects, just uh, just the RTC project stuff. Uh, that, that's correct, um, Commissioner Mulhern. We we want to make sure that um, anyone that's working in within the rail corridor. Um, either works with us or works directly with environmental health in order to make sure um, all potential users and, and people in the vicinity are kept safe. And, and so the, the, the funds are then sort of distributed throughout all of our projects. So, so in the attachments, they would just be kind of folded into the, the overall uh, project budget. Uh, that's correct. Thank you. Hey, um, Ms. Uh, Kaufman Gomez, I think. I'm going to just try to look Thank at who's raising their hand. Thank you. Um, can you can you discuss a little bit? You said that there were some uh, reductions, for example, in um, uh, the the rail corridor. There, so there were reductions because you're going to maximize other resources. Can you elaborate a little bit more about where we're maximizing other resources or the potential of that? And then if that money is just gonna be a set aside until it's needed to, to leverage it some way or that it's gonna be invested in other projects as a result of getting um, other resource funding. Sure thing. If you look on page 22-13 of the packet, <clears throat> it's um, there are two primary lines there. The, line three, which is the railroad bridge rehabilitation line. Previously, we had $2.2 million programmed um, for railroad bridge rehab, and we're reducing that down to 500,000 for some of the pre-construction work that we've been doing. We are um, looking at different grant opportunities there. And if those require a match, we would come back to the commission at that time to reprogram some of that 2.2 million. Um, on line 5B, there's the preliminary engineering and environmental analysis for transit. This was something that was allowed within the Measure D ordinance. Um, and specifically identified as um, the types of analysis that would be reasonable to do with Measure D funds. Um, previously, we did have $4 million programmed there, and we are reducing it down to zero right now until we have a better um, assessment of how much that analysis would cost and what different kind of grant opportunities we might have. In total for the rail corridor, we have um, $5.3 million set aside in reserve that the commission could program um, in the future. That said, if the commission wanted to program some funding for those categories today, you could, but um, as staff were recommending, not showing those funds right now until we really have a better sense of what the grant opportunities are. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, is there anyone in the commission, any other um, questions from the commissioners? Um, I'll open it up to the public hearing. Um, I think we have a line of people who would like to chat on that. Mr. Peoples? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Brian Peoples with Trail Now. 
Trail Now was a, a supporter of Measure D. Actually, our supporters uh, were gave the most funding um, to make it pass. Without our support, it would not have passed. Um, I'm hopeful that the RTC commissioners who did not understand the allocation for rail now understand that rail is not included. I want to talk a little bit about the North Coast. The farmers came to us. They came to us to help facilitate a solution. We helped put together an alternative solution that was reviewed and analyzed as part of the EIR to have it going not through their board. It was decided by the EIR and the commission not to do the alternative. Um, when the farmers, the farmers continue to fight, the day before they had to sign the non-disclosure statement to say we will not sue, I personally told them, you got to go through with it. You got to be a team player. So I want to make sure that it's well understood that Trail Now supports the North Coast Trail. That's very important. And so then when I'm talking to find out the logistics or the funding, um, and I hear something else, and I come back to this commission and raise that flag, don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger, especially being derogatory. I've been on this, involved in this organization for over 20 years, personally. I've personally been involved because I believe in transportation. I believe in our community. I've been coming to these commissioners uh, meetings for over 10 years. It's unacceptable that a commissioner, Mr. Leopold, would use derogatory statements to our organization, calling us trail never. Seriously, please, let's have a little bit of respect. I've been coming to this, and if I'm just telling you what I hear, please don't be derogatory towards me. I believe in our transportation. We support it Measure B, and we continue to support it. Thank you very much. Ben? Yes, thank you. This is Barry Scott again. And again, I want to thank the commission. Yeah. This is Ben. Oh, I'm sorry. I would like to refer to segment 12 which you have in your packet, which shows the cost to, to improve Highway 1 from State Park Drive to Freedom Boulevard as $101,414,000. And Measure D has 14 million. That leaves 87 million. Now let's double that because we know that the estimate's gonna be low. And so you're short $190 million. And you're gonna do this in five years? During this five year period, when we're going through recovery from an economic downturn and the pandemic? No, that doesn't work. Trail only works and it would work right now over the existing trestles. Thank you. Ms. Donna Murphy? Uh, good morning, commissioners. This is not Donna Murphy. This is Mark Masidi Miller. And I wanted to ask uh, Rachel if she could put back the summary slide from her presentation about the number of miles of the rail trail that are underway. I, I, didn't, I didn't catch the figure. I'm remembering 15 miles, but I, I don't remember if that's the right number. Could you put that back, please? Um, I'll work on sharing the screen. It's 18 miles is the quick answer, though. 18 miles. Thank you. I want to just acknowledge and thank and and offer some generous, much deserved applause to the Regional Transportation Commission for your incredible foresight and commitment to the rail trail. I've been working, as you know, on the rail trail for over 20 years. And it is great to see it actually underway and that we would have more than half of it done in the next five years. The rail trail is a game changer. It will provide a safe, level, paved surface for everyone to use, and it'll bring about a more equitable 
more sustainable, more prosperous future for our community. Thank you. Mr. Scott, Barry Scott. Thank you. Um, I, I, I really appreciate the RTC and the, and the, uh, the five-year plan looks great. I, I want to uh, uh, echo what uh, Martin City Miller just said, 18 miles in five years is significant. Changing plans around the highway uh, over crossings or anything else right now could do nothing, or, or the North Coast for that matter, would do nothing but delay things. And I am just uh, very grateful for uh, the way you stay the course. But I wanted to speak to, to ridership. I'm very protective and defensive of transit, public transit. And, you know, I, I, I'd point out in 2015, the, the rail feasibility study never carefully studied ridership. And it said uh, that next steps upon selecting a, a, a specific scenario, the next steps would include careful study of ridership. And we've never done that. Um, I should point out that not everybody telecommutes not everybody, the service industry folks, are gonna to continue to have to drive. So any, any thought that telecommuting is gonna solve our transit problems is, uh, I think, unsupportable. When you start off as a transit, a relatively transit poor region, discussing cuts makes no sense. And it makes even less sense as more and more households are strapped for money. There's less disposable income around and we all know that driving takes up a huge share of a household budget and a much bigger share of a household budget for working class families. So this is a good time to double down on transit, not start looking for cuts. And I thank you. Michael Saint. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, nice presentation. Also, I know sometimes when I speak up here, uh, you may feel like I don't appreciate all you people, but I do. Uh, you're doing great work. Uh, you all work very hard and going in the right direction. And I'm also glad that you do have the enough funding to continue with the projects. Of course, you know which project I don't like, so I won't bring that up right now. Um, but considering the Oxaline projects, I know you do have uh, further EIRs to uh, do. And I'm just wondering, are you using the new um, SB 743 basically CEQA guidelines for the next EIRs on the Oxalane projects, which uses VMT and greenhouse gas emission reductions, or are you still using the uh, same level of service as we did in the past? Uh, and if you are using level of service, uh, how do you rectify that with the new laws that have come out July 1st? Thank you. I do not see any more hands up, Commissioner. Okay, is there, uh, anyone could briefly answer the question? Uh, I mean, we're not, we don't have to answer every, each of them, but uh, the last question. We, we will be using VMT. Okay, that's, that's good. Thank okay. you. Okay, there's nobody else, um, there are no written comments that have come in? I move the staff recommendation. And I second it, like Rockin. Move, moved by Schifrin, seconded by uh, Rotkin, that we accept the staff recommendation. Please call the roll. Commissioner Rotkin? Aye. Commissioner Gonzalez? Aye. Commissioner Bator? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Leopold? Aye. Commission Alternate Mulhern? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Bertrand? Aye. That passes with one no. Very good. Okay, we will go back to uh, Commissioner Reports, uh, item 19. I might just make a brief. Uh, report on the road, uh, you know, with all the fires, uh, I, I traveled San, San Lorenzo Valley the uh, couple days ago with Sheriff Hart and uh, talked with our public works director in the county, Matt Machado, and there's not much road damage, uh, terrible 
damages to house. Uh, the first estimate that was reported today as structures, there was 340 million and they're still counting, but uh, there are some serious uh, uh, um, uh, damages to uh, like Swanton Bridge and so forth that'll have to be addressed in the Bonnie Dune area. But by and large for the roads per se, there was a, a terrific amount of damage done to them during the fire. They held up very well overall, but there are some spots. But um, any other commissioner reports? You actually had a question, Bruce, from Trina when uh, when we ended this item before, just to remind you. Uh, uh, you got to remind me. <laughs> Let Trina remind you what her question was. Uh, yes, we, we had a discussion with Monterey County and the rail oh, and the process me. there. And Very so well. I was just thinking it might be helpful if if um, Ginger could provide a, a bit of a highlight for that meeting um, to the commissioners. Uh, commissioners, uh, this is, if I might, this is this is Luis Mendez. Uh, it, it might be a good idea to uh, have something agendized for a future commission meeting, and we can invite someone from the transportation agency from Monterey County to also provide information. That way, you get you get you know uh, uh, more complete information about what uh, TMC is doing. Uh, but you know, we're aware of what they're doing. Staffs been involved in in meetings with them and, and and sharing information what they're doing, what we're doing. Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea to make. Uh, let's let's do it that way. Uh, we'll. Yep. Uh, We'll have, if we could ask them maybe to report with the, uh, present a report with us um, next month, that'd be great. Okay. Right that works. Thank you. Okay. Any other commissioner reports or questions? Uh, the director's report, our own report. Mr. Preston. Thank you, Chair McPherson and commissioners. Um, I have a fairly short report uh, today. Um, starting first with the uh, notice preparation of a draft environmental impact report, environmental assessment for the Highway 1 auxiliary lane and bus on shoulder improvements between Freedom Boulevard and State Park Drive, and also the Coastal Rail Trail Segment 12 project is scheduled to be released on September 17th, 2020. This notice also includes a scoping online open house to see comments from responsible and trustee agencies and interested members of the public regarding significant environmental issues, reasonable alternatives and reasonable mitigation measures to be explored in the draft EIR EA. The proposed improvements include 2.7 miles of auxiliary lanes and bus and shoulder improvements on Highway 1, replacement of two RTC owned railroad bridges, and those are being replaced because they're not long enough. It has nothing to do with the, uh, the load rating of the bridges. Um, it's so that the highway can be widened. Um, and construction of a 1.25 mile segment of the coastal rail trail. As, as the lead agency for CEQA and under NEPA assignment for H H HWA, we'll be accepting comments between September 17th and October 16th. The notice information on how to attend the open house and instructions on how to submit comments will be posted on the RTC website and of course we'll email all of our interested parties as we always do. Um, I also have a, a, a quick update on wildfires and transportation infrastructure. The CZU complex fire has burned more than 85,000 acres destroying over 14 hundred structures including 925 single family homes. On August 18th, Governor Newsom issued a state of emergency proclamation for hundreds of fires actively burning during extreme weather conditions throughout California. On August 24th, President Trump declared a major disaster exists in the state of California and ordered federal aid to supplement state, tribal, and local recovery efforts in areas affected beginning on August 14th and continuing. Federal funding is available to seven counties, including Santa Cruz. On August 24th, Caltrans requested that RTC, the County of Santa Cruz, UCSC, and our four cities submit our initial damage estimates for the wildfire damage to their federal aid routes. I'm pleased to announce that RTC did not sustain any damage to the rail line. Unfortunately, the county reported um, the following regarding its transportation transportation infrastructure, that there's a huge amount of fire debris on all the roads. Trees are a major concern with them continuing to fall daily. It's, um, Matt Machado estimates that it'll take months to fully assess 
and remove the hazardous trees. Swanton Road was the worst hit. Um, there's a complete loss to the bridge over Mill Creek, significant bridge damage over the Scott Creek, um, and three culverts were lost in the fire. Um, working on uh, their assessment still, um, but preliminary damage on all roads um, include the loss of middle beam guard railings, signs, and some asphalt damage. Um, the county has completed all initial roadway assessments and is entering the information into an online GIS mapping. Uh, repair work is beginning this week, but the county does not yet have a schedule to finish all uh, repairs. Most roads will be open for initial access within the next week or two, except for Swanton Road. Um, Matt's initial assessment um, that he's gonna submit to Cal OES, and this is for roads, water, and sewer is about $30 million. Um, so we look to get some federal aid in that area. Um, if you're looking for um, information on road closures, um, there's a great website. It's um, uh, SCC for Santa Cruz County, roadclosure.org. And that has all the current status of road closures for the county. Um, with that, I'd like to also um, welcome Scott Eads from Caltrans, who's attending his first RTC meeting here. And he may have some additional updates on um, impacts of the fires on, on the state highway system. And that concludes my director's report. Hey, Ms. Eads, would you like to uh, make a statement or report? I mean, yeah, that's, that's I, coming, I did have a report. That, that's coming up next, but uh, might as well be right now. Okay, sounds great. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, my name is Scott Eads. I'm here for Tim Govins today. And uh, you'll be seeing my face more frequently in the future. So you, you're, I know you're familiar with Eileen Lowe. Uh, she retired uh, in, at the end of July of this year. And so I've been a, appointed to fill her shoes and those are big shoes to fill. So um, I'm looking forward to my new role and working with you folks in the future and your staff, of course. And uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, myself to, just to give you a little background on who I am. Um, by education, I have an undergraduate degree in city and regional planning and then a master's in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, I worked for SLOCOG for a while, who is uh, your partner agency in San Luis Obispo County as a regional planner. And then um, since then, I've been at Caltrans for over 20 years now, um, working in traffic operations and project management. And then most recently, I am a, uh, have been the corridor manager down in Santa Barbara 101, where we had a um, major program of projects going through multiple jurisdictions, all within the coastal zone. So um, that's been uh, my passion and um, my work for the last uh, several years. I also did a stint as the acting deputy district director for transportation planning and local assistance um, back in 2012. So um, I have been in this role before for a period of time and looking forward to the future. Um, I do have some additional reports on fires. Um, it sounds like you're already aware of what's open and what's closed. I will say that, it, that if you're not all aware of it, that Highway 1 is open again. Um, north of Santa Cruz, which is good news. Um, we still have closures extending on um, Big Sur Coast on Highway 1 in Monterey County. Um, we are doing everything we can on Route 9 and Route 236. In reality, Route 236, we expect it to be ex closed for an extended period of time. We're working with um, park systems and others on that, but there's trees down all over the place, as Mr. Preston just noted. Um, on Highway 9, we still have closures um, north of um, Boulder Creek as well. Uh, we are, we do stand ready to work with the county and other jurisdictions on um, emergency processing, emergency federal funds, anything that can qualify on the federal aid system. So um, we're, we're I, I believe we're already engaging with the county and others and we'll continue to do so to try to help expedite and process um, those emergency projects on the local street system. Uh, we're also initiating emergency projects on our own and we've already, we're already out there with crews um, addressing the damages that have occurred. Um, also, I wanna highlight a couple projects. One is on Felton Route 9. Um, we did receive funding that was approved through the, the uh, California Transportation Commission for a pedestrian in, uh, access enhancement project. Um, 
it's between Graham Hill Road and the San Lorenzo Valley Schools Complex. So the focus there is to try to improve um, the pedestrian experience, improve safety. Um, it's a challenging environment, as all of you probably know, in terms of uh, the situation there with, with physical constraints, right-of-way constraints, drainage, driveways, um, retaining walls, and other things. So it's kind of complex. Um, effort, but we're going to work through that, and our goal is to provide um, connectivity through that stretch. In terms of a, a general time frame, we're looking at construction beginning late 2024. There's a lot of work to do. We're just beginning the environmental phase, so I'm sure we'll be engaging with some of you um, and the county and others and the city of, and the, the community of, of uh, Felton as these, these improvements in, progress. And then another one I wanted to highlight is a Watsonville crosswalk enhancement at Marchant and Beach on, on Highway 152. Um, I know this has been an interest of Commissioner Caput in the past, and so I just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, we're getting close to construction there, um, and we're, we're expecting to begin construction in October. Uh, and that project includes uh, a number of improvements at that intersection, including flashing beacons, um, crosswalk improvements, signs, and yield markings to also um, really focus on on the pedestrian experience and safety. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you for thank you. the uh, the progress on the Highway 9 pedestrian access uh, where there's a terrible fatal uh, accident there about a year ago or so. Uh, but thank you. And, uh, and in general, I think we're going to narrow some of the, la the lanes down and uh, have more. Um, there'll be a longer backup, but the, the system could work to get people through that intersection at Felton, I believe. Is that correct? I mean, in general? At this point in time, my understanding is we're, we've uh, have an initial concept that we went we identified in order to be able to program the projects, but we're beginning the environmental phase. So we'll look at a range of different solutions. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of complexities there. We also don't want to take away all the shoulders and then have a problem with bicyclists. So we're, right. you know, we're trying to improve pedestrians and sidewalks, but also preserve um, shoulders for bicyclists and for motorists. So yeah, that's, that's one of the things that we are looking at is trade-offs, but there's operational implications um, associated with some of those. So uh, we'll be looking at a range of solutions and coordinating to, you know, to the degree there's trade-offs um, with big operational trade-offs, um, we'll be, you know, wanting to make sure we're, we're fully vetting that and there's community support and local agency support for doing so. Good, right. Any other questions from commissioners for yes. the public? Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, welcome. Um, and I just really want to thank you for the update on the March um, improvements. Uh, as a city councilman uh, for the city of Watsonville, that crosswalk has been really one of our number, number one priorities to, to up, have upgraded by Caltrans. So we thank for all the efforts that you guys are pushing this project forward. That's okay. all. Thank you, Mr. Schifrin. Oh, let yes. Mr. Caput, Mr. Let, let Mr. Caput follow up on that, I think. Okay, I, I, I want to welcome you also, and uh, thank you for answering my question before I even ask it. Uh, that's <laughs> the uh, crosswalk on 152 on Marchant, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing that done. And uh, you're new, I know, uh, but we'll give you all the credit. Okay, very good. This is different. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wanted to also welcome my new Cal uh, Caltrans representative and ask a question having to do with uh, fire damage uh, on the north coast of the county. Um, a concern was uh, brought to my uh, our attention regarding the Waddell Bluffs and a concern that the trees at the top of the bluff had been extensively damaged as a result of the fire. And the concern was, as you know, that's an area that is already all threatened with um, part of the bluff coming down and, and getting onto the highway. And so I'm just wondering whether Caltrans is aware of that problem. And if so, 
uh, uh, any efforts uh, occurring to stabilize the top of the bluff to uh, avoid uh, erosion when it starts raining. Uh, so I'll answer that question, Mr. Chair, if that works for yes, you. Yeah, go, yes, please. So um, we, are, we are aware of that situation um, and it's part of the assessments we're doing on all these areas that have been damaged by fire. Um, we're looking at all you know, drainage systems and culverts and the fact that um, you know, we know from experience that after fires, um, we can end up with erosion problems that can end up with pieces of the highway or the whole highway washed out if we're not if we're not taking preventive measures. So that's part of what we're doing now is looking at uh, what preventive measure, measures we can take um, and we'll be processing those through emergency projects. So um, I'll make sure and follow up with our maintenance folks. I, I've heard of that location being discussed um, and concerns about about the, the erosion there at that location, but I'll follow up just to make sure that they're fully aware of it. Could you also um, uh, inform uh, Supervisor Coonerty's office of the status once you check it out, please. Be happy to. Thank you. Okay, who's next? I've lost my video, visual, so. This is Mike Rotkin. Okay, well, go ahead, Mike. Um, first, I wanna also welcome Scott. Uh, it's good to have you on board. I have a comment on the uh, director's report uh, which, which we kind of skipped quickly over into Scott's report. And that was about the, the two railroad bridges in the uh, Aptos area. And uh, first of all, thanks to uh, um, Director Preston for his comment about the, the not, not being about the weight of the train, but about the need to widen the road there. And most importantly, that needs to be widened, not just for the auxiliary lane project. It's the one place on the Highway 1 where the bus on shoulder doesn't work unless we widen those bridges. It's not possible to get the buses under them. So those who are interested in uh, public transit issues, it's really an important part of the making the, the bus on shoulder a viable project. And it will off, offer the opportunity to widen the uh, pedestrian and bike path on the top of the bridge when it's it, when it's rebuilt. But that's not the reason we're doing it. The reason we're doing it's for the bus on shoulder and for widening the auxiliary lane. So I wanted to point that out. Thank you. That's it. Commissioner Bator. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, uh, I also want to uh, uh, welcome our, our new representative from Caltrans, and I'm glad you're here, Scott. Um, I, I also want to commend uh, Caltrans for the recent paving project on Highway 1. Uh, much appreciated from uh, the fish hook up through Aptos. Uh, I know that uh, the paving is done. It looks like they're in the phase of uh, completing striping right now. And my question is, uh, following that striping, there seems to be a lot of debris that's accumulated on the road. Is, is part of your whole process? following all the construction where there'll be a debris cleanup of uh, all the litter and everything on the side of the road. Uh, I can attempt to answer that, Mr. Chair. So I'm not familiar with the specific location. Um, however, we typically will um, do sweeping. The litter removal is, is a separate activity. Um, and we do have a, a location for to be able to submit maintenance requests. Um, commission staff's probably aware of that, but I can certainly convey that um, location as well. It's a website, um, and that way they're logged and tracked um, if it's trash or litter removal or any kind of debris like that. But um, I can, I'll, uh, I'll check in with our construction folks about what's happening at that specific location. Yeah, just to be specific, it is from uh, on northbound. It's from uh, Park Avenue to Bay Porter. It seems to be the area where there most of the debris is if we want to be specific. So thank you for that. Mr. Lowell. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lowell Hurst, uh, city councilman and uh, RTC alternate uh, for uh, Ms. Coffin Gomez. I just wanted to thank Scott for his uh, work in Watsonville and his focus on Watsonville. You know, we're very uh, transit dependent on, uh, on Caltrans in Watsonville due to the Highway 1, 152, and 129 highways uh, bisecting our, our town. And so we say thank you for your safety. Thank you for helping us out in so many ways. And we look forward to your uh, and welcome your participation in Watsonville at all times. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, we might have lost our our chair. <laughs> Who's vice chair? <laughs> uh, Mr. Gonzalez, can you move us forward? Holy guacamole, man. 2020 is really coming with surprises. So um, we're at the Caltrans uh, report. Uh, is there any further questions or comments? We're uh, I do have a couple of hands up. For I can't the see public. them. So. Uh, um, um, ben? Uh, I would like to re remind everybody that Caltrans had a proposal four or five years ago for the double-decker solution and leaving the trestles that are there now for one heck of a lot less than what you're talking about now. I just want to remind you about that. And I'd like Caltrans to, to look into that. Why are you switching? Over. We also have uh, Mr. Peoples. Hi, this is Brian Trail now. Um, welcome, Scott. Welcome to um, to our Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission Trail now. We're we're a big advocate for building the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail um, and widening the highway. We want HOV lanes, toll road, widening highway. That's the solution for and uh, and. And then just want to note, Ben asked about the double-decker. Um, I know that when uh, the prior engineer for RTC looked at widening the highway by Aptos, where the two train trestles are, is um, the cost was high because you have to lower the, rail, the highway in order to get it under the railroad. So if they were pedestrian passes, you wouldn't have to lower the highway. So it was about $65 million in savings by not having to lower the highway. So that's been just a comment on that. And then finally, Scott, um, our meetings here really aren't that contentious. So uh, just what we had really, we're all friends and so welcome. And uh, that's all. Thank you, Brian. Uh, who's next? I don't see any other hands, Commissioner. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna close the report on the Caltrans and the next item is closed session. No, we have item 23. Item 23. The rail vehicle demonstration issue. Okay. Okay, uh, good morning, Commissioners. This is uh, Luis Mendes of uh, the staff. And uh, as, as you're aware, the. You know, Transportation Commission purchased the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line in 2012 to preserve existing rail service, implement recreational rail service, build a bicycle and pedestrian path, and investigate potential future rail transit uh, service on the railroad right away. Uh, the RTC has ensured continuation of freight service, implemented the recreational rail service, began construction of a bicycle and pedestrian path, um, and you know that's quite. Uh, Quite a bit of progress on that and it's completed a couple of studies on potential additional uses of the right-of-way and it's currently in a, a continuing to study uh, transit on the rear line right-of-way in partnership with, um, with Santa Cruz Metro as you're aware. Um, in September of uh, uh, 2019 the RC received a presentation from uh, TIGM which is a company based in Southern California that uh, manufactures electric uh, trolleys that are powered with uh, onboard batteries and hydrogen fuel cells. And then in the, uh, uh, December of 2019, uh, RTC did approve a, um, uh, a temporary license for a demonstration of the uh, TGM vehicle. Um, unfortunately, through an, a number of things, including uh, COVID-19, that has not been uh, possible yet. Uh, so now it uh, seems that the, the earliest that such a demonstration could happen would be in the spring of uh, 2021. Uh, for um, TGAM, uh, did uh, prepare a, uh, a video simulation of what a real vehicle might, might look like um, going down the, the track to several locations in, in Santa Cruz County. And so we have. Uh, Mark Johansson and Brad Reed from uh, uh, TM that will present that uh, that video uh, for you. 
and they can provide more information on, on plans for having a, uh, a demonstration uh, in the spring of 2021. So with that, uh, Mark and, uh, and Brad, you can proceed. All right, uh, how does it sound? Hear me? Good. Great, thank you. Well, good morning, commissioners. My name is Mark Johannes. I'm a resident of Aptos. I have a, a law practice here in Aptos as well. I'm here with Brad Reed, who's the president and CEO of TIGAM. So as uh, Luis mentioned, last spring we presented a proposal to demonstrate a uh, streetcar system on a Santa Cruz branch line. Um, which can achieve high capacity public transit goals along that branch line. Uh, the demonstration was approved at the commission at that time, but a lot has happened over the last year, everybody is aware. Uh, so we were originally planning this in early spring, um, but we originally, then we had to postpone that to late spring, um, mainly due to weather considerations. We we're considered a roaring camp schedule uh, to not uh, impede with that at all. And also, since this is going to be a physical demonstration to maximize um, a space where community members uh, and interested parties can actually participate in the physical demonstration. So the pandemic hit, um, and so we um, originally thought that we might be able to do this in October. Uh, that's back when um, the pandemic was at the state where we thought we'd all be open by July. Obviously, that hasn't happened. And so um, now we're looking at doing this in spring. Um, of course, that's all going to be contingent on the pandemic. Uh, there's developments there, as you all are aware of. Um, so uh, we haven't set a date, but we'll use the same considerations uh, when we look at the demonstration in terms of uh, you know, how to maximize uh, the public viewing of this type of demonstration, as well as, as um, Roaring Camp's schedule, which we haven't confirmed yet. So, um, at the um, prior RTC meeting, um, we um, stated the uh, demonstration was to allow the community members to uh, have a look at this technology using uh, the real experience, uh, which is uh, compatible with the RTC's planning for the Santa Cruz branch line and show how um, a high capacity, quiet, zero emission and light uh, weight streetcar system can be fully compatible with other uses along the branch line and trail line, including bicycle and pedestrian traffic and vision by the Santa Cruz branch line. So what we want to do, uh, we prepared a short video um, to show a representation of what the vehicle would look like in, in local settings. Um, staff is going to cue that video up. Um, we were concerned a little bit about uh, the quality of this, but um, after the video is done, we'll give some details on where that could be located as well. So please uh, play the video. have been um, as, as good as we wanted it to be, but um, you, I think, get the idea. The video is available at santacruzstreetcar.org. Um, so it's a YouTube video that uh, the folks in the community can take a look at. So Mr. Reed and I are available um, for, to the commissioners now to answer any questions you may have uh, about the demonstration. Is there any questions from any fellow commissioners? I have one, Aurelio, Mike. Go ahead, uh, Mike, and then uh, John, um, what, what, Randy. Sorry. I wanted to ask what kind of capacity for carrying bicycles the uh, trolley might have. 
In other words, if you're gonna have several of them, not maybe not every, it does, it's not like a train with several different cars, but to what extent can it be adapted so that it's capable of carrying more than one or two bicycles on the back or something? Sure, at this point, I'll um, introduce Brad. Brad, would you like to address that? Sure, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for allowing us to speak a little bit here. Um, yes, the, what was shown in the video was uh, our 100 passenger uh, tram. We also have a 200 uh, passenger tram, which is an articulated three car body vehicle. Both of those trams are customizable with interior and exterior bicycle racks. Uh, that's a matter of design. Now, when we get to uh, ridership studies and uh, capacity studies, we can redesign the interiors uh, during uh, the design period to fit as many as 10 to 20 bicycles per car. So um, that's a, a big consideration for this alignment. And uh, the main consideration that we're looking at now is that, uh, you know, the number one goal of any public transportation system is to get people out of their private automobiles. Uh, by, com by giving them a complete end-to-end -end solution for their travels, creating a communal sense of place that is a connected, walkable, exciting place to be. And this is done by connecting all of the alternate modes of travel into a seamless whole. In the case of the Santa Cruz branch line, this means making every single tram stop a multimodal stop for buses, rail cars, and bicycles. Uh, these three modes support one another. When we give motorists a viable opportunity to leave their cars at home, all three of these modes of travel will see increased ridership. These modes of travel do not compete with, them, with one another. They, they complement one another. So we fully intend to design the cars to carry as many bicycles as possible. Thanks for that answer, I appreciate it. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Randy, you're next. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned, um, and it was, I actually saw it on the screen where it said affordable. Help me understand affordable. How much, how much would this cost with uh, all the infrastructure and everything else? Can you give me a dollar figure, please? Uh, dollar figures can't be uh, delivered without having a design. So uh, we do design under contract. Um, I can certainly give you figures for the costs of cars. Uh, no, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about, you know, so the cost of a car is just one aspect of the, sure. of, of the total amount. Absolutely. So you can't really say that this, this is affordable uh, in a vacuum saying, well, our cars cost this when the un underlying infrastructure might cost 10 times that. Um, so um, I, I just want to question the whole concept of affordability because in my mind, if it was affordable, we'd be building it by now, but we don't have the money to do half the things that we promised for Measure D. So um, I appreciate the fact that you're, you, you want this to be affordable. I kind of like the look of this, but at the same time, is it realistic? Will it really take people you know, off the highway? Is it fully integrated um, with uh, point to point, um, we're, we're seeing the same promises were made for the smart train up in Marin and none of those have actually happened. So that's why I'm a little bit skeptical, but uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Does any other fellow commissioners have any questions? Uh, Chair, this is uh, Commissioner Leopold. Again, sorry for the lack of uh, video this morning. My camera is not working. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure whether this is a question for the, TG, the, uh, the, the TGM folks or our staff, but would this be cut, if we were looking at our transportation corridors alternative analysis, would this be considered commuter rail or light rail? This would be considered light rail. And, um, and is a, a light rail compatible with freight? You would have to have at least temporal separation. So, uh, you broke I, up where you froze. I'm sorry. Are, am I um, frozen now? Uh, it's not me talking. It's someone else talking. You should go on, guy. Could you okay. repeat that? Uh, so I, I know Mr. Prince, uh, Executive Director. Can he, if you could repeat what he said. 
So this would be considered light rail. Um, and regarding compatibility with freight, um, you would have to have at least temporal separation. So um, freight would have to run at a different time than these were on the road. So you couldn't have uh, freight and um, these vehicles intermixed because of uh, the crash worthiness. Um, but you could run freight um, during non-commute hours and run these during commute hours. Got it, thank you. Um, and maybe to the, to the, the folks who put together the video, um, it, it's my understanding that you could have more than one car on this. Uh, and, and, the, and the one that you just showed us, how many people would, that, would a car that size hold? It was 100, John, they told us. Oh. And would you be able to add on other cars? Yes, we have a product called uh, a Virtual Coupler. Uh, the 100 passenger cars can be coupled virtually at the push of a button. Uh, one driver will um, control up to three cars in a consist. The same can be done with the 200 passenger car. Two 200 passenger cars can be virtually coupled to provide a 400 passenger car. Uh, and this can be done to uh, reduce excessive driver costs, to increase capacity during special events, and what have you, to do, decrease the event of uh, uh, um, deadheaded empty seats. And, and these are run on, uh, there's absolutely zero emissions that come out of, out of this vehicle? Correct, they are battery operated. They, operated. they operate for 16 hours on battery only. They have a hydrogen fuel cell auxiliary uh, generator on board, which charges the batteries while they're in passenger service. The only emission from the hydrogen fuel cell is pure water. Well, it sounds very interesting. I appreciate seeing the video. It gives me a sense of the scale and, and how it would uh, move in traffic. And uh, I look forward uh, uh, to seeing more in the, in the demonstration in the spring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Is there any other fellow commissioner that has any questions or comments? Uh, just to say I'm back. Sorry, Aurelio. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Patrick had a question. I was just getting in the group. I did, uh, I, did, I did. Take it away. I, I did see the presentation. Mr. Mulhern, did you have a question? Uh, oh. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so ba based on uh, your other uh, commuter uh, tram projects, can you give us an idea of what the annual cost of operations and maintenance are? Operations and maintenance is 90% man hours. Uh, it really depends on the uh, design, the, what's called the duty cycle of the operation. Um, utilizing uh, a 15 hour duty cycle, we have done a cost model for operation of both a commuter line and an excursion line uh, covering the entire 32 miles of the uh, branch line railway. Now, based on the capacity, I, I have uh, videos available, if anyone wants to see them, of computer simulations of operations on both of these alignments utilizing our technology. Because of the unique nature, the unique attractive nature of this particular alignment, we believe that the operations and maintenance costs can be covered by Fairbox, advertising and sponsorships. Um, I will give you a, a ballpark figure. It's about $8 million per year for the entire 32 mile line uh, utilizing um, passenger commuter service between Watsonville and uh, West Santa Cruz and an excursion line between Capitola and Davenport operating uh, 360 days per year at 15 hours per day. Now that number, again, is based on factors uh, of an assumed duty cycle. Those numbers can vary greatly depending on the factors used in the cost model. Sure, and, and, and thank you very much. And, and um, how, many, uh, 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 how many examples in the real world do we have of this technology being used um, daily in a, for commuter passengers, your, your specific technology? Yeah, the, the technology that you saw in the video is operating now in the city of Doha, Qatar, in the Musharraf downtown Doha tramway system. And that is the first use of this particular car design. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, any other questions from commissioners? Uh, questions from the public? Yes, we do have um, uh, Mr. Lowell. Mr. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is really exciting to see and to hear. And uh, boy, this, this, this is a game changer in many respects. So maybe we should get a uh, field trip to uh, Doha and uh, see it firsthand. But seriously, you know, this is uh, very exciting uh, to, to see and to visualize. So thank you for bringing that, that video up. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think that the trip would be in Mr. Uh, Johnson's Scott Valley budget, so I don't know what we do. <laughs> uh, anybody else on, or any other public comments? Uh, Brian Peoples? Yes, hi, Brian Peoples, trail now. Um, so I, don't, I want to remind the commission and ask the question actually, uh, the estimate was 45 miles an hour, 60 trains a day. Um, from the 2015 study, which was used for the Unified Corridor study, and wanted to see if the infrastructure would sustain that and, and et cetera. But more importantly, I wanted to talk about modeling, what you're doing is what we do as an engineer for my company. And, and Leon Musk, the Hyperloop, everybody understand how the Hyperloop um, modeling works in the sense of why it has high capacity. The high capacity isn't about because of the vehicle, it's about the filling up of the tube at the maximum number of users as possible. It's like fluid dynamics. You don't want bubbles in your water, right? People are the water, right? So essentially what you just demonstrated was the pipe remains empty 99% of the time. It's not being used. And that's the whole problem with the that model that, that you demonstrated is your capacity is limited to the frequency of the vehicle in the tube use of the corridor the capacity is limited by the use of the corridor so 99 percent of the time the corridor is not being used so it's in, very inefficient and that's actually why the, the the corridor as a trail has a higher capacity of usage 800 people an hour from the study showed 800 people an hour would be using the corridor. And actually the study showed that if you're doing that number of people using the trail designed for transportation, 800 an hour, which a single highway lane is 2000 people an hour. So you're, almost, you're doing half, almost half capacity of the highway. So now if you have that many people using the trail corridor an hour, you will reduce surface street traffic. You will reduce highway one traffic in the core section. And it will, Greg, it will help Watsonville traffic coming from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. So I want to remind you not to look at the actual vehicle. You got to pull yourself out. In, when you're doing modeling, engineering, you're looking at the corridor, maximize the corridor as much as possible. And right now, e-bikes, walking, other alternative active transportation, enabling people to use rubber wheeled vehicles, rubber wheeled soles on that corridor is what we need to do. We don't need to dedicate it to a publicly funded small little vessel like what you just demonstrated but appreciate the time and actually i think that modeling is good to show our our viewers because it will help thank you thank you any other questions um from public uh michael saint you have to unmute michael i did it thanks mike uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Reed, Mr. Johansson. Uh, great demonstration. I just have one quick question. Uh, the infrastructure to basically fuel this uh, a train, you mentioned hydrogen and stuff, is that going to require just one infrastructure area that would uh, have this ability or would we need one or two or three along the corridor? Uh, this would require one maintenance facility for the entire 32 uh, mile alignment. Is uh, that... hydrogen, hydrogen is produced uh, in a small electrolysis plant 
uh, that produces uh, hydrogen from electrolysis of water. Okay, so no bringing in of hydrogen. It would just be all done on site? Correct. Okay, great. Any other questions for the public? Ms. Arnold? <clears throat> Thank you. Sally Arnold, uh, board chair of Friends of the Rail and Trail. Thank you so much for this virtual demonstration. It makes me more excited to uh, when the f finally everything settles down and we can see it in real life on our tracks. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm, um, I, I'm impressed by, by uh, the uh, um, uh, estimate uh, um, that some people have of the fitness of our community, that some people will be walking 20 miles to work from Watsonville to Santa Cruz um, instead of uh, taking the freeway. Um, and good on them if they can do it. That would not be me for sure, but I could definitely see myself uh, riding my bike to um, a light rail like that and uh, getting my bike on it and then maybe using the bike to go the last mile to my destination. That, that seems very doable to somebody who, like me who's only moderately fit. Um, but the um, I'm really excited to see the modern technology. Um, I think this might really put to rest the notion that somehow rail transit has to be some giant 19th century coal-fired locomotive on our tracks. There's, there's uh, so many exciting uh, new options available and um, I hope that we are able in the future to get demonstrations of lots of different kinds of modern vehicles like this. I think it's going to be very inspiring for people. Um, and uh, the idea that it can scale up easily um, with the virtual coupling and then, you know, scale down again when it's not needed is also really exciting. And um, I appreciate the time and effort that you have been putting into uh, trying to show us what the uh, modern options are for our rail corridor. And oh, and one last thing, I think it would be a lot less um, impactful on the neighborhoods, you know, people who live near near the, the uh, rail corridor to have quiet, um, a, a quiet rail vehicle of some kind going by every you know 15 minutes than um, a nonstop parade of um, buses to fully fill the space. Um, so thanks. We have Jack Brown. Mr. Brown? You have to unmute, Mr. Brown. Yeah, sorry, I had to uh, get through the uh, menu button there. Um, I, I have a real concern with uh, the RTC chasing after leading edge technology like this. Um, although they state that uh, at TIGM that Doha is an example of this being put to use, uh, this is something that hasn't been used for more than a couple of years there and Doha's uh, usage is on a 1.3 mile loop and not a 33 mile corridor that we're experiencing here. Another issue I see is that we're in a new normal now. Um, just like 9-11 affected a lot of things with security, we're seeing with COVID-19 that we're going to have a whole new normal on how people are going to respond to being packed into small vehicles for long periods of time. To have a vehicle like this that currently right now seats 100 with a COVID-19 seating arrangement, we're looking at something that maybe it holds 10, 20 people per car. We currently have over 50,000 people when things were in the prior normal doing the commute from Watsonville to Santa Cruz on Highway 1. I don't see how 20 people in a car where we, with only three sightings on our corridor can support anything that alleviates traffic or gets people out of their vehicles. We may have a few full cars going from Watsonville where no other community can get on the, the, the tram until it gets to downtown Santa Cruz or wherever it's going to be going to, to provide anything to the rest of the county. Um, we're really just getting sucked into a, a fascination with uh, with a technology without looking at what is the overall need for the entire Santa Cruz County. And I really hope that the RTC doesn't get sucked into this uh, display and, and essentially propaganda uh, event for the rail and trail um, come whenever this this demo is supposed to happen and we get back to looking at real needs to satisfy equitable transportation throughout Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Scott. 
I, I have a just quick comment on the last yeah. person's yeah. comment to us. It, it, you have to uh, understand that the bus system right now is carrying more people than the last speaker was projecting uh, for vehicle. Our vehicles hold about half of what the, this one is projected to carry. And we're carrying more than he's saying we would have on it. When we uh, add, which we're doing already on the transit district buses, plastic shields between the rows of seats, it's possible that you could double or triple the number of people you would carry. So there, I think the speaker is absolutely correct that at least as long as we have COVID concerns, which are probably going on for at least several, you know, many, many years, even perhaps before we get this thing built. But even if we did, it'll probably have some impact on how many people are willing to pack into a vehicle, but it's going to be a lot more than was projected. And I think there's this sort of general scare tactics going on that people suggesting that, you know, things will not work. It's the like the, the incapacity to make things happen. And people are, of course, welcome to make their comments and they're, they're uh, to express their concerns about these kinds of things, but I don't think we should be terrified at the idea that uh, the COVID thing is going to make all public transit disappear or no longer be viable. I think it's a ridiculous point of view to be blunt in my comment. Thank you. Mr. Scott? Mute. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I, I've been uh, looking at the, the TIGM vehicle for some time and I wanted to point out that in addition to Doha, uh, a different version, a heritage version, uh, which is an old, old-fashioned looking vehicle, has been running in Aruba. I don't, uh, Mr. Reed might be able to tell us how many years that, that's been running. So it's not that new a technology. Um, and it's the idea of a hydrogen has, has been proven in a number of different vehicles that uh, I think three different car manufacturers have a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Uh, interesting to note is that locally using electricity from Monterey Bay community power is going to mean that the hydrogen that's produced is carbon free. Um, this, this vehicle as a type seems to check off all the boxes. It's a small scale. I think it's narrower than a city bus. It has an 11 inch floor boarding height, just 11 inches off the ground to roll a wheelchair on or off or bicycles. If I understand the uh, documentation, it seats 50 and, and provides uh, room for another 50 in the short version, shorter vehicle, uh, as standees. And with the longer version, you have 100 seats and uh, 100 standees. So the scalability of this seems just terrific. But that video shows really well how the scale of the vehicle fits so well in those communities where there's been so much reasonable concern, Aptos Village, we don't want a big train, you know, locomotive and multiple passenger cars coming through. No, this is a, a completely different thing. So I, uh, I hope the RTC will give it its uh, uh, most sincere consideration. Thank you. Mr. Matt Farrell. I just wanted to Thank Walter and Brad for the presentation and the uh, commission for uh, accommodating it. As a bicyclist, uh, I, say, I think that having a link commute like this would be an extraordinary opportunity for thousands of people in our community. So I hope that the demonstration moves forward and people can get a firsthand experience of this. Thank you. Ben? Yes, I would like to talk to the traffic between Watsonville and going towards Santa Cruz. I have uh, early in the morning during the commute hours stopped at the rest area and watched the traffic. One third of the traffic are trucks for electricians, plumbers, uh, contractors. They're never going to take the train. They've got to go to the job. Another 10 or 20% of the traffic are big trucks and they take up four or five spaces. They're not gonna go on the train. So I think part of the problem can't be solved with what you're talking about. Thank you. There are no other hands, uh, Race Commissioner McPherson. Okay, well, thank you for the presentation. I. Uh... I think it's been uh, discussed thoroughly and I uh, look forward to uh, looking into this further in the, the near future. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Johannesson. Mr. Reed, uh, appreciate it very much. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go on to item number 24, a project list for the 2045 Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan. Amy Naranco. All right, so let me uh, start sharing my screen here. Okay. All right. Okay, can you see my screen here? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Well, hello and good morning, commissioners and members of the public. I'm here today to provide an update on the 2045 Regional Transportation Plan that's scheduled for final adoption in June of 2022. Um, so as a refresher, the Re Regional Transportation Plan, or RTP, is a state-mandated plan that identifies transportation needs in Santa Cruz County over the next 20 plus years. The RTC is responsible for developing, implementing, and updating this plan every four years. The last update to the RTP was in 2018. Mm -hmm. So the RTP consists essentially of three major components. The first component is the policy element. And this defines the transportation goals, the policies, and performance targets that are set for our, our county. And the RTC approved this component in February. The second element is the financial element. element. And this part estimates uh, the funds that will likely be available for transportation projects over the next 20 year time frame. And this is expected to be completed in the early fall. And third is the action element. And that's what I'm here to discuss today. Uh, the action element identifies the transportation needs in the county through a list of projects and programs that are needed to operate, maintain, and improve the transportation system. You'll find in the replacement pages of your uh, agenda packet for attachment one that includes a comprehensive list of projects that have been compiled for your input today. Some of the projects that are included in the project list inc include improvements to highways and local roads, additional bike and ped facilities, improved transit and goods movement, and transportation demand management programs, just to name a few. Some of the local agencies have also been involved in this, uh, in this development of the project list, and they've provided either, uh, they've identified projects that they've identified through their own planning processes, as well as including, uh, as well as there are projects that have been identified by members of RTC advisory committees and members of the public. So, Projects that were identified by members of the public are provided in attachment two of your, of your uh, agenda packet. There were 91 project ideas that were submitted by the public through the new projects ideas form that's available on the RTC website. Some of these ideas are the, actually, excuse me, the ideas were solicited via RTC's mailing list uh, to, our, to our listservs, um, was provided information on our website blog, as well as uh, information shared about uh, submitting ideas through our social media channels, including Facebook, um, excuse me, Facebook, social, uh, excuse me, Facebook, <laughs> Twitter, and Nextdoor. Uh, most of the projects that were recommended were already on the project list and there were additional comments that were added. Um, but it is, however, helpful to see what, um, what the public priorities are. So, Next steps, once the draft project list uh, is approved, um, staff will begin working with project sponsors to essentially split the project list into two lists. One is the, the financially constrained list, and that will include any projects that could be implemented within foreseeable revenues through the year 2045. And then the other list is the unconstrained project list, and that will include projects where additional funding uh, beyond projections would be needed in order to implement. So after the project list is separated into both the constrained and the unconstrained list, the projects will then be brought back to project sponsors, uh, to the advisory committees and the public for additional review. And then in February of 2021, uh, staff will come back to the RTC for approval on that constrained project list. The RTC is also working with AMBAG on the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and the Sustainable Community Strategy. The MTP SES is the federally mandated long range plan for the tri-county region of Santa Cruz, Monterey and San Benito counties. And this project list that's developed for the 2045 RTP will also be included in the 2045 MTP SES. 
And then once that is completed, the, um, we'll continue with uh, undergoing a program level environmental review and then production of the draft RTP and then the draft MTPS SES. So with that being said, staff recommends that the RTC identify any additional projects or gaps in the transportation uh, system that should be considered as a project in the 2045 RTP and then approve the draft list that's, a, that's in attachment one and then direct staff to submit this approved project list uh, for inclusion in the 2045 MTP SES. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to take your questions and any input you may have on the project list. And also to note that Heather Adamson from AMBAG uh, is also on the call if you have any specific questions about the MTPSES or the EAR. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, any questions from members of the board? Uh, are we being asked to approve this uh, draft project list today in our meeting with a resolution? I don't see a resolution. This is essentially... It's Go ahead. Yeah, it's a, it's a preliminary draft list, um, and we'll continue asking for the, the full list for the constrained project list in February. So this is essentially just um, approval to look at all of the lists here um, and really identify all of the potential projects that are needed in our county, and then they'll be, um, the, the list will be constrained with, uh, with additional revenues that are available, and that'll bring that list to you um, in in February, and with that will come a, a resolution to uh, to accept that list. Yeah, okay. So this is an opportunity to add to this list uh, rather than to uh, vote to approve it or in some form. Thank you. Correct. Yeah. Right. And commissioners can do that or, okay, any other uh, comments from commissioners? I, I have one. Okay, sure. Mr. Gonzalez. Yeah, I'd like to uh, propose that we put on the list the Harkinsloo Bridge uh, that will connect uh, Harkinsloo to uh, the Buena Vista Labor Camp? You know, uh, would, um, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of how, we, when we're going to have this come back, should we have recommendations from the board, uh, Mr. Preston, to uh, submit recommendations for additions, more deletions to the plan? Or how would be the, pro what would be the right way to proceed with this before we have a formal <clears throat> presentation next time. Amy, do you wanna answer that? I'm sorry, I, I kind of, I missed the question here. Um, if there's recommendations for additions to the plan, uh, what is the right procedure? Is it to submit them to you or to the, uh, the commission itself for to be included in the uh, report or how, how would we go about that best? Yeah, you can uh, you can submit the um, the recommendations to me, and then I will I will coordinate with with the project sponsors and or the local jurisdictions um, to see if that project should be included in the in the list, and then um, we can get information moving forward. Okay. So if uh, Mr. Gonzalez, I'd like to have him know if it's been accepted or not, or in the procedure. Go ahead, Mr. Gonzalez. Yep. Yeah, uh, that's actually my question. Uh, it's, is this the appropriate time? It sounds like this is the appropriate time, and if we wanted to add a project to the list, that this is the, the moment to do so. Yeah. So that's why I'm recommending that we add this project to the list, the rebuilding of yep. the Hartman Slough Bridge. That'd be, that'd be proper, too, right, if we wanted to do it now. Uh, did, uh, is there another member of the commission that had a um, question about this, or...? Uh, Mr. Mulhern. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Amy, w w there's a county project, County uh, P27K. It's the, the Spreckles Drive improvements. I, I see that the project description and scope is just kind of the boilerplate county major collectors projects. But on this particular mm -hmm. stretch of major collector, we would like to add pedestrian facilities as well. It just kind of speaks generally about roadway and roadside improvements on various major collectors, including bike lanes, transit turnouts, left turn pockets, et cetera. But there's no mention of pedestrian facilities. And on this particular road, we would like to see the inclusion of pedestrian facilities in any project we put in there. Well, do I'll add that to the, the description. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the commission? Commissioner Brown? Yeah, I just have a quick question. I think it was answered by our um, public works deputy director, but 
On the Santa Cruz list, I, at the top, uh, there's two items around the coastal rail trail segment seven, Bay to California portions. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, are those different kind of within that segment uh, seven phase two or um, or is that, how, how does that work out? And I, I think I sort of understood, but I was told that they're kind of, that's listed twice. And so maybe it, that's gonna be changed. I'm just wondering what you can tell me about that. What was that project again? So um, for the, it's SCP131 and, and then the trail 07B SC, they're two within the Santa Cruz city uh, list, our tip list. Um, and they're both for coastal rail trail segment seven, phase two between Bay and California. So they're listed, that is listed as a bicycle pedestrian pathway parallel to the railroad tracks. And it's listed twice, one at uh, one under SCP-131 and then yeah. the one just below it. So I'm just wondering, is that yeah. two um, discrete pieces of that project or how that? What's that? No, that was a that was a duplicate there that was uh, unintentionally added. So it's been it's been removed from the replacement pages. Oh, it was in there. Sorry, I should. Yeah, got Mr. Yeah. Uh, Gonzalez. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to make sure that I was clear on the the request that I was doing for the a new bridge to be built over the Harkin Slough, not the Harkin Slough bridge that's going over Highway One. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, understood. And also a question, on the public comments for their projects, are we gonna include those or should, can we do that now as the commissioners? Amy, uh, what's the, pro the process? Would you, uh, if, the, if members of the public had recommendations, were they, I mean, they would not not um, automatically be included, maybe. Or, or what? What's the process right now? Would uh, if there if somebody from the public wanted something added or taken away, mm -hmm. um, we that that's going to take ultimately uh, commission approval. How would you proceed with that? Are you going to put it in the report if somebody wants something added or? Um, so. Yeah, so what we uh, generally we've done is if the the recommendations have come in and then if it's not already included in the RTP project list or under under a, a project that's already listed, we'll coordinate with um, that local jurisdictions, um, public works department or or the responsible individuals and and we'll see if that project is um, should either be included in, in a project that's already listed or if it is uh, an additional project that they want they would want to then list separately and then we would list those separately um, for the most part right now everything is going in is the full the full comprehensive list the wish list of everything that either we want to happen or should happen in the county and then as we continue um, developing that list. We can make some, some adjustions or some modifications to that list. However, any of the projects that are moving forward that going into the constrained and unconstrained should not necessarily have any other um, major impacts to the county. So we can make some small modifications, but we wouldn't be adding any additional larger, larger uh, projects once we get into the constrained and unconstrained list. Okay. If I understand this, Bruce, because it's a bit confusing. I'm going to have to get going on something. You're going to make um, suggestions. You're going to put all those down on a list. And then we are going to decide in February, I think it was, yeah. uh, what to put on the constrained list that we actually think we can fund and make happen. Is, do I, is that the process we're involved in? So all it takes is a suggestion. We'll put it on the list. Yeah. It doesn't mean it'll get on the constrained list. That'll be a staff recommendation, but then right. the board will decide whether they like the staff recommendation or want to amend it in some way. That's what we're talking about, I believe. Yes, right. That is correct. Mr. Schifrin? Yeah. It, I think it's a little bit more than that, in that, as I understand it, the pro, what the commission is doing here, if it approves the staff recommendation, is approving the preliminary draft project list that will then be used for the environmental review. 
So while the commission could ultimately change it um, and add projects or take them away, any significant changes would have to be looked at in terms of whether it affects the environmental document. Yeah. And so, I mean, my sense is that these projects are uh, the result of the request from the various jurisdictions um, that we all represent and the transit district and the commission staff, this would be an appropriate time if there are additional uh, projects that anybody wants to add to the list. I think the commissioners, the commissioners, the commission would have to approve any additions. It would have to be, I think, as part of a motion to approve the staff recommendation with an addition of such and such a project. I think we're making a formal we're being asked to make a formal action, take a formal action here that's going to lead to uh, the environmental review and the preparation of the final RTP that will come to us for final approval. But I think this is the time to make changes if commissioners really think that changes need to be made. Commissioner McPherson, um, Heather Adamson has been wanting to speak on this. Okay, I am going to have to leave shortly. And if I do, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, would you take over uh, the meeting again? Thank you. Heather? Okay, this is Heather Adamson with AMBAG. I'm the planning director. Um, we've been working really closely with Amy and the rest of the RTC staff on putting together, you know, um, this draft project list for Santa Cruz County as well as the other counties. And to address uh, Commissioner Schifrin's comment about the EIR, AMBAG is the lead on the four agency joint EIR. And the list that you're looking at today is, as Amy mentioned, is the wish list. And so in the next couple months, we'll be finalizing the revenue assumptions on how much we can afford and how much Santa Cruz County and RTC can afford for its projects in the RTP. And so that's the list that will come back to you in February with a resolution for approval of the revenue constrained. And at that point, it's the revenue constrained project list from Santa Cruz County that goes uh, for analysis in the EIR. It's not this complete wish list. We clearly identify in both the county level RTP as well as the AMBAG MTP SCS, what is revenue constrained project and what we can afford and sort of has been identified as the unconstrained. So only the revenue constrained projects are included in the EIR. And so that action will take place next year and then we'll develop, begin developing the EIR in the spring and scheduled to be released at the end of 2021. I hope that clarifies a little bit on that side. Well, that's a helpful clarification uh, for me. Um, so the commission will have a chance to yeah, yeah. add or delete projects when the uh, theoretically realistic list comes back in February. Uh, I've moved the staff recommendation. Okay. We so, have some comments from the public. Okay, Mr. Gonzalez, if you would take over at this, this point. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Trina has her we, hand up, Mr. We, Gonzalez. Uh, I think we left off with a staff recommendation. And then we were going to go Commissioner Kaufman Gomez has her hand up. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Gomez. Yes, thank you. Um, to add to them, to clarify, the bridge between um, Santa Cruz County and Monterey County for the Monterey Bay Sink Sink Scenic Sanctuary Trail, in terms of trying to get that up on the list a little higher if possible. And the other thing that I'm finding is the, the southbound Riverside Drive turnoff is getting sig significantly um, busy. And as we're developing, Helping that intersection, we're backing it up on Highway 1 southbound, and for us to evaluate that particular intersection for better flow through there so we don't have any issues at backup one at that location and um, the safety, as we'll, we'll probably see more pedestrians in the experience in that intersection. So, those are a couple that I can think of that I've seen that should be somewhere on that list. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like to go to the public comment, Commissioner Gonzalez? Uh, yeah, I just have one, I guess one more last comment because like, everybody kind of broke up uh, and froze for me. Um, I have one last question, just for clarification. 
So the, the comments from the public that they put in will be considered on the wish list? Just a yes or no. It's fine. Be added to the wish list, is what they said. Yeah. They're frozen or I'm frozen, one of the two. Luis, did you hear the question? Maybe you can answer. You're on mute. Commissioner Gonzalez, if I might, if I might add. Um, Go ahead, whoever it is. I'm, okay, I'm, try, I'm trying to unmute and, my, and the computer is muting me back. I'm sorry, I think I think I can speak now. But I might okay. add, yeah, I mean, the, the comments that we get from the public, is, as Amy uh, mentioned, we do take we take all those comments into consideration and we work with the local jurisdictions who tend to generally be the project sponsors for, all, for um, most of the projects. And a lot of the things that get submitted by the public, they're already included in the list or are part of other projects. So we work with, work with them to make sure that, the, that that is the case. If that's not the case, you know, the local jurisdictions think they are, they are uh, uh, feasible projects to add to the list and the local jurisdiction says, okay, let's, let's add this project, you know, suggest it this way and that way and so on to the list. So yeah, we, we do take those, all, all that uh, input and consider it and work with the local jurisdictions to any projects that are feasible to that. All right, thank you. Um, Okay, let's go ahead and we're going to open it up to the public comments now. Anybody uh, from the public? Uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Hurst. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, many of these projects listed under the Watsonville list are essential and have been uh, kind of languished for quite some time. They serve a disadvantaged community and, and it's to high time that we uh, try and focus on this disadvantaged community and help get them moving. And so I want to support all those uh, projects and 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 we need we need a lot more transportation improvements everywhere but let's also uh, look at some of the most needy as as well as the most disadvantaged aspects of our community and try to get them moving too thank you ben any other public comments ben ben go ahead ben okay since you're talking about 2045, I'll be 111 then, so I'm not so sure I'll be around. But I want to talk to Patrick's point, Spreckles Drive, because um, I, I, I know all the potholes. A lot of people don't know them, and there's a lot on that street. In fact, uh, I've bicycled by there once. Was another bicyclist on the ground, and a neighbor, a new neighbor, two uh, two, two doors down, three months ago hit that and she got wounded very badly. So that's important. Now, lastly, I'd like you to consider bus trail. Bus trail. The whole path can be asphalted and both can use them. Just consider it. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the meeting and uh, you're doing a great job. Diversity creates a great and better world. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, any other public comments? Bob? Go ahead, Bob. Bob, you got? Hi. Okay, so, go uh, my comment, I want to second what Tina Coffin Coma said about the uh, Monterey County, Santa Cruz County Bridge. And I haven't heard on a regional basis, uh, we've been talking about internal traffic within Santa Cruz. But if you improve that bridge and have access to um, Pajaro, you then have access to the main rail line and Caltrain is gonna have a stop in Pajaro. So that would give access to the entire Pacific uh, Peninsula, San Francisco Peninsula and the train track that goes to Los Angeles. So it gives access to all of our uh, population to take a, another way around to get to Gilroy or get to uh, San Francisco or to LA. So that bridge connects us to the central connection. So when you're talking about regional connectivity, I know it's a tri-county stuff, but it's actually a statewide connection. And that bridge is one of the key links. And in addition to the big, bigger picture of that kind, we have soccer kids that live in, in Watsonville and there's a soccer park in Monterey right over that bridge. So to have a nice little pedestrian and bicycle access and improved track over that bridge, it's gonna make it a lot easier for our kids to play soccer at that existing facility. So there's lots of reasons to make that a high priority project. 
and my last name's Colbert, so I didn't put it on there, but uh, thank you for all your time and energy in this meeting, and I appreciate all your commissioners, and thanks for uh, listening to my comments. Thank you, Bob. Any other comment, public comments? Um, uh, Mr. Uh, ben has his hand up again. Um, any other? I'll be, I'll be brief. Hang on, Ben. Is there any other, but anybody else besides? There, there is no other hands up, Commissioner. Okay, we'll give you Ben. I want to talk about the Watsonville Airport. This is going to become a very important part of our county. We have people moving here who are not going to commute anymore, except they're going to want an airplane or rent an airplane or rent a charter service to get them someplace else. So the opportunities there are tremendous. I especially think there should be more done at the Watsonville High School in getting kids in their junior and senior year familiar with aviation as a career. It's right next to them. Anyway, thank you very much again. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Ben. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close public comments. And do we have, are we gonna move on a recommendation? No action, or is this no action required on this There was no action required on this one, right? Right. So with that, I guess I'll close Actually, our- I, I, I'm sorry, Miss. Um, do I have another item? There, there is a staff recommendation right. to, to approve the preliminary list with whatever. Oh yeah, there is staff recommendation yeah. with RTC to whatever, additional wherever, projects or gaps. Yeah, whatever's added, so. Okay, staff so recommendation. I, I had that recommendation to add that I'll, I'll, move, I'll move that we add all those comments that we got from either board members or uh, commission members or the public. Anybody second? Second. I'll second. Who? There we go. Andy, is Andy, second I second the motion. Uh, Mike, Mike motioned. Right. Um, we roll call. Commissioner Watkin? Aye. Commissioner Gonzalez? Aye. Commissioner Bator? Aye. Commissioner uh, McPherson? Commissioner Leopold? Commission Alternate Mulhern? Aye. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Caput? <clears throat> Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Bertrand? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Leopold? I think he might have left us. Okay. So that passes with uh, McPherson and Commissioner Leopold have left the meeting. All righty, well, thank you folks. Uh, I think that wraps up our general agenda items. Am I correct? Yes, yes right. it does. We'll move go ahead and move closer. on to a closed session. Yes. So we'll see you in about two and a half minutes. That's closed session. Yeah. Mr. Chairperson, if I may, that for sure. the commissioners, the um, invitation was sent to you in an email from Ian Barry this morning at 8.01. And we will not have a reportable action out of closed session, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Stephen, doesn't, so, doesn't the chair and uh, yourself have to come back out and tell people nothing happened when that's the case? I think the rest of us don't have to come back, but I think you do. Well, right, we would come back, but I was letting the, the staff know that we don't anticipate a reportable action. Well, it really was a job. You're letting that. me know that I have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We, st we stay on this call, correct? No. Yeah. You check your email. Oh, I got to check the email. Okay. But you, can, but you can leave this one open so you just come back to it. That's possible. Yeah, if you look for an email from Ian Barry at 8.01 this morning, mm -hmm. that will be the link for the closed session. And Okay, leave this I'll, one and come back to that one. Okay, thanks. All righty, folks. We'll see you in a bit. Yusenia, are you there? I'm here. Oh, good. <sighs> so do we, um, all we need to do is adjourn the meeting. Uh, correct. And I would, Yusenia, I would, report out, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, if I may, um, yep. I'd report out that the commission met in closed session. 
and that they're, they provided direction to their negotiators, but there's no reportable action today. Okay, thank Alrighty. you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Meet us in right. uh, Bye. Bye.